Uh, good afternoon or good morning to all and welcome to this webinar on how can cultural heritage drive and enable social cohesion and inclusion in the recovery. Warm welcome to our project cities in Italy, our 12 cities with whom we work through this project. Bari, Bergamo, Bitonto, Casale Monferrato, L'Aquila, Pieve di Soligo, Reggio Emilia, Taranto, Trapani, Trento, Verbania and Volterra. All these cities have very strong cultural policies and have participated or won uh, the bids for the Italian capital of culture over the past few years. I'm also very happy to see that we are joined today by a lot of cities and regions and representatives of uh, different ministries uh, from across the OECD countries and beyond. So uh, I welcome friends from Barcelona, Lisbon, uh, Singapore, Bratislava, Kosice, Mexico, and the US from ICOM, the International Council of Museums and the European Commission. This webinar is organized by the OECD and it is the first webinar in our project on recovery strategies for Italian heritage cities. This project aims to provide practical guidance to heritage cities in Italy and we hope also elsewhere as they redesign their culture-led development strategies in the context of the crisis and the recovery. Together with the Italian heritage cities, we have chosen three themes which reflect their current priorities. Today, we'll focus on the social cohesion role of culture. And later in the year, we'll have another two webinars to discuss cultural heritage and creative entrepreneurship and cultural heritage and tourism. Uh, and of course, we do this work uh, in cooperation and with the support of Italy, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, International Cooperation, and the Italian Ministry of Culture. Italy has been championing uh, the, the work on culture with the OECD, but also with the G7 and now with the G20. And we are particularly honored today to have with us Ambassador Antonio Bernardini, Ambassador of Italy to the OECD, and Mr. Paolo Toschi, G20 Chair of the Culture Working Group and Diplomatic Advisor to Minister Franceschini. With this, I am very pleased to pass the floor or the screen to Ambassador Bernardini. Please, Ambassador, the screen is yours. Thank you, Caterina. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to all the participants to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of um, a project that we have launched on culture, tourism, and uh, local development new strategies for Italian heritage cities in the post-pandemic scenario. This is an initiative that um, is, um, has been uh, uh, elaborated here in Paris with our OECD friends. And uh, the origins of this initiative are uh, uh, very interesting. When I joined the OECD uh, at the beginning of 2020, there was a very interesting and worrying discussion going on at the OECD. And the discussion was, uh, should OECD uh, continue to look at uh, tourism? Is tourism a, a relevant activity for OECD? I find myself quite surprised of that discussion, but that was uh, what was, was going on at that time. Uh, after uh, a few weeks, uh, uh, started the pandemic and the COVID uh, uh, created what we, we have seen. And suddenly in a few weeks, everybody has changed mind. Everybody has realized uh, unfortunately, thanks to, to COVID, that tourism was very much uh, relevant economic activity, has a lot of impact uh, uh, in our society. Uh, tourism and culture uh, are very much intertwined and uh, culture also was uh, very much suffering from uh, the pandemic. And the uh, cities, the local development, uh, which is very much dependent upon these activities, were, was suffering a lot. So what was... Uh, probably seen as a kind of judgment on an economic activity, superficial judgment on an economic activity, changed rapidly. And this is, uh, I uh, believe, uh, very good. But what is uh, uh, more interesting, the reason why we decided to launch this initiative with OECD and the, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Culture, is that we uh, have to take, uh, uh, in a way, advantage of this uh, uh, difficult period to understand what we can do better in the years to come, and now we can uh, um, start shaping our uh, strategies for, for recovery. Uh, culture is a key to, to Italy, uh, but I think it's key for, for many countries and the participation today shows that the interest, the interest in this subject goes very much beyond uh, our own uh, borders. We have uh, invested uh, uh, 4 billion to alleviate the impact of the crisis on uh, the creative economy 
and we will invest 4.7 billion in next generation EU programs to support cultural infrastructure, support green and digital transitions, promote culture-based regeneration of remote communities. So once we are facing uh, ourselves with this uh, big challenging scenario, I think the, having a discussion and having a, a, a putting together all those who are uh, involved in these sectors, uh, it's, it's relevant. It's relevant not only for uh, Italy, for the Italian heritage, for the Italian culture, for the Italian cities, but it's important, I believe, for all countries. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, the interest shown in today's seminar is a clear demonstration of the great interest that uh, we see on these topics, uh, putting together culture, tourism, local development, as well as creative industries. And this is a group that we have created within OECD of ambassadors, friends of these subjects, uh, which has received a lot of support and shows that uh, interest is there. Situation has changed within OECD. I'm very happy for that. But clearly we have to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, what kind of indication, what kind of tools uh, will be useful for all the uh, local authorities, for all the governments, in order to uh, promote culture, tourism, and local developments in the years to come. Now we have together a, a number of cities that uh, have been mentioned, I'm not going to repeat, but these cities are big and small. And this is a, a future of, uh, of Italy, of course, that we have uh, uh, such a richness of culture and tourism in big and small cities. But this is very much relevant in terms of indication we can draw from uh, the discussion, the webinars that we are going to have. Uh, we aim at having uh, tools that will not be used for only, only for Italy, but that we are aiming at having um, indications, policies, uh, discussions that will be of interest for all the cities uh, uh, around the world. So with this uh, uh, hope that uh, we'll be able to reach such an important uh, results, I again welcome you all to this uh, meeting today. And uh, I welcome uh, all those who are uh, uh, participating, as well as let me finally thank uh, all the OECD colleagues, Professor Sacco and my colleague Paolo Toschi that will be participating in the opening remarks. The only thing that I, I, I don't like today is to apologize because I have an OECD council meeting in the afternoon. So at a certain point of time, I will disappear. And this is really a pity, but uh, uh, for sure, uh, since probably this is going to be recorded, we'll, be, we'll have a chance to, to follow the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And maybe another um, uh, another maybe sad, sad uh, thing is that we not we don't meet in person somewhere in a nice uh, Italian uh, city. But well, at least uh, with the digital, we can also reach out to a lot of cities uh, outside uh, outside Italy across the OECD countries. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I'm very pleased to introduce and give the floor to my colleague. Uh, Professor Pierluigi Sacco, Senior Advisor uh, on Culture and Local Development here at the OECD. Pierluigi, please. Thank you very much, Katia. And it's uh, really a pleasure to have opportunity today to launch this, uh, this workshop that I think, uh, as it has been testified by the, the, the huge uh, international participation, could not be more timely. Well, I think that uh, we, we, we are clearly in a moment in which, as was already as mentioned by the ambassador Bernardini, uh, we are uh, in some sense being taught some lessons by this pandemic. And um, I think that there are interesting parallels from this point of view uh, between what's happening today and what has happened after the Great Depression. We know that uh, the shock of the Great Depression probably retrospectively will not be seen as so different from what's happening now with the pandemic. Clearly, clearly, there has been an unprecedented slump of the global economy. Uh, there has been social disruption. Of course, there has been public health disruption, as we know. So the level of the, of the challenge that we have to take on is, if not unprecedented, clearly at historical peaks. But uh, we know that one of the consequences of the Great Depression has been uh, the launch, uh, basically, of what is macroeconomic policy today. So a new approach to systematically address the stabilization of the economy through new tools and uh, new methodologies that have become uh, a cornerstone of the modern governance of global economic systems. So we are facing a similar challenge. So we have an enormous responsibility, but unlike the Great Depression, now there is an awareness that this challenge is also related to our capacity to uh, in introduce in, in, the, in the recovery strategy, elements that are uh, in some sense a novelty in this regard. And certainly culture is one of them. 
So I think that for, for cultural planning, for culture-led development models, this uh, tragic situation is a whether an incredible possible cradle of methodological innovation and policy mainstreaming. So from this point of view, I am particularly proud that is Italy in this moment that launches this, uh, uh, this uh, new idea of, uh, of uh, a new perspective of, of development of local uh, uh, culture-led development strategies that are uh, responsive to these new challenges of the pandemic. Um, uh, as I, I'm sure uh, Paolo Toschi will mention after me, this of course also nicely relates to the important uh, cultural agenda that has been advanced in the uh, actual presidency of the G20 uh, by Italy. And I think that this is also an invitation to really create a global coalition of players to experiment with these new possibilities and to launch new pilot experiences and, uh, and explorations that could uh, really inspire many other territories to move along similar lines. Today, we will see some uh, very interesting experiences that are already moving along this trajectory and that can give us uh, lots of food for thought, but especially this will be a call uh, to action and first of all a call to policy thought uh, to really uh, develop the new tools and methodologies that we need and uh, probably retrospectively it will be interesting to see if in five to years time five to ten years time we will be will have been able to develop uh, this new methodological and policy approach that like in the great depression has uh, helped us to, to turn the problem upside down. So let's be optimistic and positive and proactive uh, and let's start with this exciting work. Uh, Katia, the screen is back to yours. Thank you, Pierluigi. And of course, the, the role of the OECD here is very much about um, culture proofing uh, the different policies, policies like employment, entrepreneurship development, regional development, uh, inclusion, et cetera. And also main, helping to mainstream culture across all these different uh, portfolios beyond the cultural policies per se. Uh, well, with this, I'm very happy also to give the floor, the screen to Mr. Toski, who is joining us from Rome, from the Ministry of Culture. It's a real pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. Thank you to friends and colleagues at uh, OECD uh, for having me today and a warm greeting to uh, Ambassador Bernardini and to colleagues in Paris. Um, so I, I'm thankful for this opportunity to go over uh, a great, uh, great topic that you have been focused, focusing on now for, for a long time and we're all uh, developing uh, the results of uh, long-standing efforts within the Ministry of Culture, uh, in particular. This uh, this is an effort that uh, has uh, relied upon great professionals that are engaged in working with the OECD, and uh, I want to recognize and acknowledge them. What I will try to do very briefly now is to give you. Uh, on, on, on one hand, a sense of how Italy is approaching uh, inclusiveness and uh, uh, our topic of discussion, really. So uh, the, the uh, support to local um, cities and authorities as, as a way to empower culture um, as a bridge, as a bridge uh, that helps us uh, uh, tackle divides. And on the other hand, uh, a couple words on what Italy does uh, as a G20 chair uh, for this year in, in this framework. Uh, so uh, firstly, uh, Ambassador Bernardini already mentioned that Italy is devoting uh, a great deal of attention to culture and tourism uh, in the framework of uh, what we call the recovery and resilience plan. So our uh, framework of uh, reform and uh, uh, regeneration that we are really uh, setting up for the medium to long term. And this is how Italy looks at uh, its own future. Uh, it's, a, it's a broad effort, uh, a very collegial effort. At the Ministry of Culture, uh, we are responsible for a significant component uh, within this uh, EU endeavor uh, devoted to, to culture um, and uh, it bridges with tourism 
very, very directly. Uh, these two sectors together account for around 15% of Italian national GDP. Uh, and many of the cities, municipalities, regions that are represented in this call today uh, in Italy know very well how this sector mobilizes a very significant share of uh, total employment, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, creative companies uh, with uh, a huge uh, amount of, of value added. The, the running figure in terms of value added to our GDP pre-pandemic was close to 100 billion uh, a year. Uh, and of course, this is a sector that has been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Hence, the need to uh, approach it uh, now with a, a lot of uh, dynamic energy and to really inject uh, resources and a vision um, on, on, on this uh, sector. Um, the objectives are uh, very clear when we look at how we, we approach this sector and we share these objectives as central government with the, the cities and the regions and the municipalities. Uh, we need to invest in our, culture, in our cultural capital. We need to upgrade it. Uh, we need to, again, bridge barriers and so create inclusiveness, much in the spirit of the work that you're doing um, in this workshop today and in this program. Um, and we need to foster a regeneration that is really led by culture. And the challenges that we face uh, in this framework really call up uh, the inclusivity uh, issues that we are all uh, trying to address together. So for instance, we need of course to resume flows and activities uh, after, the after the pandemic. We need to resume them safely. Uh, and this is a first and, and foremost uh, challenge. We need to do it increasing accessibility uh, to the venues, to the cities, to the what we call the uh, locations of culture. Um, we need to balance flows and, uh, and so uh, not only involving uh, the prominent attractions, whether it is uh, the largest or the, the, the the best known cities. We need to balance flows also to smaller and to rural uh, locations. And we need, to be, we need to be very mindful of safety, uh, uh, investing resources in making sure all, all of the attractions and all the attractors are as safe as possible from climate condition to uh, other, uh, other challenges. So the work that we're doing as national government in particular within the Ministry of Culture on uh, the recovery and resilience plan to respond to uh, EU next gen is, is really addressing these challenges. And very briefly, I will mention that some of the components directly address uh, some of the cities that are represented here today. For instance, Bari is represented in uh, a crucial component, which is what we call the strategic investments plan on cultural heritage sites. So uh, Bari and the south, south coast uh, of Bari, the coast park of culture, tourism and environment is, uh, is addressed. And so are dozens of other uh, sites. Some of them were presented here today. Uh, so we, this is really an ongoing effort that will drive reform in Italy for uh, years to come. Uh, other challenges that we will try to, to address and to recognize are really connected to the digital dimension. And so trying to improve uh, the digital uh, dimension of uh, the cultural offer, whether it is uh, digitizing uh, the heritage, whether it is uh, offering training skills, whether it is uh, offering new crowdsourcing platforms that, that help us uh, accelerate in, in this in this direction, uh, the work is uh, vast and it is of, of great importance, we feel, in uh, restarting uh, growth uh, for Italy. Now, briefly, a few words on, uh, as after I, I discussed the national dimension of, uh, of our effort, uh, brief words on what we do as, as a G20 uh, chair. Uh, and I think this is very pertinent uh, particularly because of the close collaboration that uh, the chair has with the OECD uh, as per tradition. Of course, the OECD remains a crucial partner for every uh, 
chair of the G20 to advance um, our agenda. And we made a choice to put culture really at the center of the work uh, that we do as G20 chair in 2021. Um, the uh, ministerial meeting of the G20 ministers of culture will be the first uh, meeting of G20 ministers of culture. Um, and it will be the first ministerial under the Italian chair to take place in Rome. It will be on July 29 and 30th. It will be, in our uh, hopes, uh, a moment of great uh, inspiration uh, for our international partners, but also for Italians to look at culture as uh, the reason and, uh, and, uh, and the driver uh, for uh, starting over again and finding uh, ways to um, <coughs> uh, grow again in a sustainable and balanced way but also to bridge uh, gaps and divides as, as uh, I think you, you very appropriately are focused on. Let me give you very briefly a sense of what are some of the priorities that we are addressing with the help of the OECD and with the help of other uh, partners in particular with of course the G20 members. Uh, there's an overarching uh, goal of focusing on how creative industries contribute to growth and in that sense, the OECD is helping us making the case of how relevant and how uh, crucial uh, really uh, creative industries are to job creation and to the creation of opportunities. Um, there's a great focus <coughs> on protecting heritage, uh, whether it is from natural disasters, from crisis, uh, from illicit trafficking, uh, protecting heritage requires uh, international efforts because all of these challenges have an international dimension, whether it is the international organizations of traffickers or the crisis that uh, often involve uh, sadly large uh, theaters of geopolitical instability. So we need to tackle uh, these uh, challenges with international instruments and we're working hard at making progress. There is the very important dimension of the climate change challenge. And uh, we will continue to focus on how through culture we can uh, tackle climate change. Uh, and there is the overarching priority of education and training, which calls upon us to really focus on the younger generation and to invest in our, in our human capital. Finally, uh, the dimension that I, touched upon also in, in, in the national sphere of the digital inequalities and how we have today a great opportunity through the new technologies that are blossoming around us to address these inequalities and uh, to overcome them. Um, I will stop here. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your word. I hope this was uh, uh, um, sufficiently wide illustration of what we have in mind at the moment at the Ministry of Culture, both nationally and in the sphere of the G20. Uh, I want to thank you all for the uh, opportunity to address this wide public, and uh, I wish you the best for the continuation of the workshop. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Toski, uh, and it was really um, exciting to hear what you say about the economic and social importance of these two sectors, the creative economy and tourism, of course, and sadly about, about the impacts um, of the current crisis uh, on this. And uh, it was uh, very interesting to also to hear your uh, views on this dynamic agenda for the future, well, starting maybe locally, you mentioned Bari, then nationally through the recovery and resilience plans, and of course, this comprehensive approach that now the G20 is taking under Italy's uh, leadership. So thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to continue to work uh, with you. So now let's uh, maybe have a look at uh, our agenda for today. Uh, we would like first to, to hear from uh, our partner cities, our heritage cities in Italy, and we'll have two presentations from one from uh, Pieve di Soligo and the other one from uh, 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 Bergamo, sorry. Um, and uh, after these two presentations, we'll um, maybe have a bit of uh, discussion, a round of uh, comments and reactions from our international speakers. And then we'll move into another session where we will hear uh, quite a number of uh, very focused and interesting presentations 
from uh, um, uh, from across uh, the world, really, with a couple from Italy as well, but also uh, very much with an interna international flavor. And then after the uh, in the afternoon, we'll have a very focused discussion with our partner cities uh, on uh, the takeaways from this webinar and how this can inform maybe uh, their uh, strategies. So let's maybe indeed uh, go into uh, our presentations. And uh, we would like first to, to hear uh, from uh, uh, Pieve di Soligo, and I'm very happy to introduce and give the floor to Federico della Pupa, who is coordinator Pieve 2022, or Pieve 22. 2022 is uh, um, the plan for the Italian capital of culture for uh, Pieve di Soligo uh, uh, at the uh, mayor's cabinet in the municipality of Pieve di Soligo. Uh, please, uh, Federico, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to present to you our a strategic plan of culture and first of all I have to apologize for my bad English because it's very rusty but <laughs> um, I would like to uh, sh uh, show you the, um, the slides um, okay um, just a moment and uh, Okay, uh, the, the first uh, um, point, we, we, when we started to, uh, to plan uh, our strategic uh, plan for, of culture, uh, we, we started to, to think uh, what is culture for us? And uh, the, the answer was uh, the culture is innovation. Uh, but uh, the the second question uh, was how can uh, we be uh, innovators in in a small territory because uh, we uh, live uh, in a small in a small town uh, twelve thousand people and um, we have to rethink in our our territory from a different uh, perspective uh, based on dissemination and inclusion but also. Uh, we, uh, uh, we thought that uh, um, our territory is not uh, only uh, based on the, uh, our town, but also with the other uh, town that, uh, 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 um, 30 town that uh, uh, today is uh, uh, an uh, UNESCO, uh, UNESCO area, uh, the Collina del Prosecco. Uh, okay, um, so uh, we um, focused uh, um, our statement about culture and uh, uh, the, the second step uh, in, in, our, um, in our plan was uh, um, to uh, define uh, the principle uh, to uh, Defined in in a, in a very good uh, um, in, a, in a very good uh, way how to implementing uh, the culture um, has uh, the a, a basic uh, system to uh, to support the economic and social development of our areas. Uh, we um, define six, six uh, principles. Uh, the first one was the enhancement of tradition. Um, we uh, think that uh, through collective and creative intelligence, uh, we have to reinterpret, reinterpret uh, them in a contemporary piece, uh, giving life to new production or new identities that persist over time and create new way, values. And um, uh, the second one uh, was the, uh, we pointed out that uh, active participation of the local community. And uh, the third uh, was the, the next generation at the center of the process. Um, because uh, active participation and next generation, the, the new generations, um, uh, are uh, at the, the core of the uh, 
political line of the development uh, of our uh, administration. And um, uh, the, the other uh, point, the, the fourth was uh, uh, to, to find uh, uh, multiplier effects uh, because action and initiative acts on the implementation of the ideas, um, the dissemination knowledge and initiate the other similar process through the motto who gets involved with us we have to um, today we have to um, build um, uh, um, a more comprehensive uh, um, uh, a more um, inclusive um, uh, culture as a uh, uh, and the multiple effect is uh, how to these strategies could uh, help us to uh, improve uh, not, not only the um, uh, not only the 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 the, the culture, uh, but uh, uh, and the cultural heritage also uh, all the other things, but uh, uh, also um, the the economic and the uh, social uh, development of our areas. Uh, the f uh, the fifth is uh, the sustainability of the action, and this is uh, normally today uh, in front of the uh, climate cha uh, change uh, uh, challenges and. Uh, uh, the, the, the last one is the technological innovation. Um, inside these uh, six uh, uh, principles, uh, we define uh, um, our, uh, our strategic plan of culture. And uh, uh, you could uh, you see in, in this little video, uh, <laughs> Our our uh, approach to the culture, uh, okay, um, is a, is a sort of uh, um, um, example of, of uh, our things about uh, uh, strategic plan of culture because for us uh, uh, the challenges that we. Uh, we have we are in front of, of uh, many challenges and uh, one of these is the in veneto in our region we have uh, 11000 unus uh, industrial buildings and this uh, is a part of land of our landscape our landscape is our culture so we have to uh, to to reuse uh, this unused uh, industrial uh, buildings, and uh, this is one of uh, one of uh, our, of us um, uh, strategy uh, because uh, um, we have the um, we we have the necessity to uh, uh, deconstruct. Uh, these unused buildings, but the construction is also a generative system because we could build a new uh, area, new building, but also new areas, but also uh, the construct is a, um, an example uh, because we uh, can deconstruct uh, material things, but also unmaterial things uh, tangible, they are also intangible. We, we have to deconstruct uh, our approach to the development uh, because uh, in the past uh, in Veneto, uh, development was uh, um, build things, uh, build uh, industrial uh, buildings, uh, an example. Uh, and uh, today we have to work uh, uh, more or, or uh, on um, uh, unmaterial things. So uh, this is in a, an example of our uh, strategic plan of culture. Uh, 
uh, inside of our strategic plan of, of culture, we have a, 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 um, an, an approach that uh, want to uh, deconstruct buildings to uh, to build to to rebuild uh, not only building but also urban parks, in example, and. Uh, these urban parts are for social uses, but these urban parts are not public, are private. This uh, for us is a very interesting uh, thing, interesting point, because uh, this uh, is an example of public and private, uh, uh, a sort of sharing by private and pri private sector uh to to build a new uh cultural approach uh, uh about our land about our uh territory our town and it's a sort of new vision uh, as a, uh, it's a sort of culture because a new vision uh, a new vi vision is a new culture for us and uh, uh we have to work at different levels uh, first of all, we have we um, must have a general framework, a strategic plan that addresses the action to be carried out, which are about action of a culture nature. But we have to rethink how to use places and how we can think of them for new uses, uses that are not only productive but also also social. And we have to set up an intervention policy that aims to deconstruct places to build sociality. Uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, this is the, the last uh, um, phrase uh, by Hilia Prigogine, uh, utopias of the future without the present. Uh, this is uh, our uh, statement. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, happy <laughs> to 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 be here to present uh, uh, this uh, uh, our strategy and uh, I hope that my presentation uh, will um, will be uh, will be support uh, uh, the the next uh, discussion uh, from uh, participant. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Federico. I like very much the, the quote from Ilya Prigozhin, uh, obviously. And it was very interesting to hear, and it will be very interesting for us to learn more throughout this project on this uh, creative reuse of <clears throat> industrial buildings and industrial uh, uh, properties and this urban regeneration that you are uh, planning. And so you touched upon land use, of course, but also the importance of how really to build these uh, partnerships with the private sector. Uh, around this um, agenda. So this will be one uh, very interesting to learn more and work with you on, on these um, aspects. And I'm sure that that's relevant for many places um, across Italy and, and uh, uh, beyond. So now let's go maybe to Bergamo. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Giovanna Brambilla, uh, who is the head of the educational services at GAMEC. GAMEC is the modern and contemporary art gallery in the municipality of uh, Bergamo. Uh, please, uh, Giovanna, the, the screen is yours. Thanks a lot. I'll try to share my screen. Gosh. Okay. Okay. So, thanks a lot to all of you for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here with such a board of professionals discussing such important subjects. I'm here to talk about a project which involves GAMEC, which is Modern and Contemporary Art Gallery of Bergamo. And this is the building I think uh, not all of you know uh, this place, but probably all of you know the name of Bergamo, which was uh, very sadly known for the uh, effects of the pandemic. Uh, and now we are sort of seeing, start to see the light. Um, anyway, the museum is 
um, a contemporary museum. It's a very versatile space. Uh, uh, we have many type of visitors with targeted activities and uh, 1,400 square meters of exhibition space uh, and uh, lots of forms of contemporary art. And we have fringe activities and uh, we are very uh, proud to deal with lots of uh, different type of uh, public or what in Italy we used to call non-public. Uh, so we work with inmates, uh, with people with disabilities, uh, with uh, deaf people, blind people, and uh, people, uh, elderly people with uh, mild dementia, and uh, as well as marginalized, marginalized people. And um, the city um, is uh, decided to give a sort of strong answer uh, to the pandemic, uh, starting to think about new projects that deals with the people, and from another side, which is not less important, uh, try to involve uh, a museum educator, because uh, uh, in this more than one year and a half, uh, we have to think that museum educators uh, are, became a very fragile uh, category of uh, working people, as they didn't have the chance to work, uh, especially in Italy, where museum has been closed for a really long, long time. And as well, uh, skew, um, the, if we think about school, uh, school did not have, have the chance to make visit uh, or to go uh, to the museum. And uh, as a museum, uh, we, we choose our compass, which is very important for us. Uh, and this is the article 27 of the Human Declaration, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And as well as it is very important for us now, after so many years of waiting for a signature, in the parliament, the Faro Convention, because inside this very important document, we found the stress to the peaceful and stable society. And these words that you keep on using, fortunately, in uh, this webinar, which is uh, to reinforce the social cohesion by fostering a sense of uh, shared responsibility, improving access to the heritage, uh, especially among young people. And uh, yeah, we are, I'm here to speak about this uh, disadvantage. And this is exhibition which is on display now, uh, which is devoted to Regina Castolobraski, which is the first woman of the Italian vanguard to focus entirely on sculpture. And in June in Palazzo della Regione, which is in the old town on the peak of the hill, we will have a sort of site specific project by the very famous artist Ernesto Nito. And from October onwards, uh, nothing is lost, which is a display aimed to investigate the transformation of the four elements in art. I'm speaking about the three exhibition because these three exhibition, which means uh, one year of museum activity are the deputy venues for our project uh, uh, where the, particip the participants will, uh, will be involved in uh, all the works of art displayed in the exhibition. In this project, we have two partners and two supporters. Uh, supporters are the Comune of Bergamo and the Fondazione della Comunità Bergamasca. Uh, they decided to sponsor this project because they uh, really believe that it is important now, I think, especially in our city, but not only, I think it's a sort of paradigm that can work for other countries and other cities as well, is to try to have new ties between people. And uh, I think pandemic uh, uh, make bigger the gap uh, between uh, wealthy people and fragile people. And um, the two partners, which are very important for us, are Fondazione Opera Bonomelli and uh, Comunità Namaste. As you can see in these two images, um, Namaste, uh, it's a big uh, association that deals uh, not just with children in schools, but has a focus, very deep focus on elderly people with Alzheimer's and with mild senile dementia. And the Fondazione Opera Bonomelli is a very um, important association as well that deals with people with very, very complex backgrounds, such as homeless, drug addicts, borderlines, or marginalized adults. And uh, they come into this place, which is a sort of hotel, it's an old hotel uh, that uh, works uh, about story, and uh, every floor is uh, dedicated to um, very different people, which drug addicts or borderline. Um, and with uh, these two uh, partners, uh, we are able to reach uh, not only the people hosted in these places, 
but people with has the same kind of fragilities in all the territory of the town and even more faster because they have a very, very strong impression connection with other association and so they are able to spread uh, the idea of the project and to open it uh, to all the city. Um, I would like to focus on a word that I don't like to use it much from uh, some uh, years now, which is inclusion, uh, because I think inclusion always makes it someone take section on someone else, uh, which is in a sort of passive role. And cohesion, which is the word you use in this webinar, means that making separate part as a whole. And um, inclusion is probably now a very divisive term, so I, I prefer not to use it. And uh, our project uh, is built on uh, uh, the celebration of emptiness. We think that you, if you have to work with the people, uh, with uh, marginalized people, you have to have a void around which uh, you have to stand uh, thinking that uh, knowledge is always crossed by default uh, and by a lack that inhabits the heart of the other. So recognizing this void uh, means that you have uh, uh, a sort of space uh, where you can really cope with people and work with different people. And for the same reason, I would like to say that the project is for these people, uh, not for these people, but with, so it's not done by someone again, for someone which is in a passive role, but uh, it, the, all the project has been uh, uh, built uh, dealing with these people, asking uh, with people what they would like to do, and so very taking care of uh, their ex expectation. Uh, what's the, the project about? Uh, we have 10 pro pro uh, workshops. Uh, each of them uh, consists of four meetings with average people aged 60 onwards. Uh, and these people is acting, imaging, and creating side by side with elderly people with minds and his dimension or affected by Alzheimer. Other 10 workshops, each of them again of uh, four meetings, uh, uh, one meeting every week, uh, just to have a sort of uh, very short idea, with average people aged uh, 18 to 60, uh, painting, sculpting, and drawing side by side with marginalized people. Um, so it, uh, we, we call this play Posto Fisso, which is fixed place, uh, uh, because we want the museum to become uh, a sort of uh, um, a recognized place in the city. We want people to know that museum was there for them and was always open and that you could always find in museum a very nice and comfort zone and a place not just to be, but to create and to promote yourself and all your individuality. As we think that heritage is a bearer of cultural identity and diversity. And uh, in this way, we abandon the ethnocentric communication, which is us, them, and we welcome on a sort of, I can say, space-time cartography of each individual. And uh, um, I think in this way, we um, try to consider art as agora, as a sort of square around which uh, we can build new experiences, new relationship, and the new knowledge. And this creates, of course, cohesion. Uh, we would like to stress that Gamek is a place where things can really happen avoiding asymmetric relationship and restarting after COVID. And as I said before, restart means uh, that uh, it's uh, free. The participation of all the workshop is free. And in the same time is a way to restart for the museum educator because we have to always think about them, which uh, are very important for our existence. This means to fight a social exclusion that precludes individuals from participating. And we really welcome uh, uh, all the people in the museum uh, creating uh, uh, active uh, protagonists with cultural citizenship, uh, which is very, very important, uh, again, focus for us. Uh, I would like to show two images uh, as a sort of metaphor of what I tried to say till now. This is a doormat by the Lebanese artist Mona Tum. And uh, this is what happens in lots of places. So a doormat that say welcome, but this doormat is made up by very sharp nails. So it's not really welcome. Um, some museums are uh, pretending to be welcoming museum, but uh, their policy is against participation and it's just for selected people. 
The second artwork is of the Coriander Dosso, who, and the name of this work of art is Public Figures. And it's to say that uh, um, art is not highlights uh, that uh, forget people, but the people makes art. So this is what art is made for, uh, to keep people together. All of these very little th figures that you see underneath this pedestal are very different. Uh, so uh, as we say, the uh, cohesion making separate part as a whole, and I think that art can lead it. And just to finish, uh, I would like to quote my, one of my favorite book, which is not a catalog or an art book, and it's Murphy's Law. And uh, the third law of human interaction say, purposes is understood by the proposer, will be misunderstood by the others. And uh, as we can say, because we started this project some months ago, evaluating from the results, eventually uh, Chishon was wrong, as we have uh, overbooking, uh, great success, uh, email coming in museum with uh, thanks, uh, and uh, people which uh, really uh, want to stop us uh, when we go out of the room after the workshop and to say, you can't actually imagine how I am happy to be here, how you make me feel part of the town now that I feel alone and that I lost uh, everything in my life. So, and it's not just for the marginalized people, it's for average citizens as well. So, uh, this is what the project is made of, and uh, thanks for your attention um, for the chance to be here. Well, thank you so much, Giovanna, and I, I, I really enjoyed your um, presentation. And, and of course, Bergamo is uh, known, very much known for its Città Alta, Città Bassa, and not just for the recent uh, dramatic um, events. Uh, you're, you're very right to underline uh, this, uh, well, of course, uh, the, this uh, growing gap between the wealthy and the fragile, and uh, you explained how a museum can, by working with different organizations, different local communities and different local organizations, um, help to uh, fill this uh, gap and you're absolutely right to underline this the that we should use the right words and the right concepts cohesion versus inclusion for them with them uh, that that's uh, and i must say that it's very much in line and in the um uh, with the uh, uh, the oecd icom guide for local governments communities and museums we also try to underline uh, all these uh, issues uh, and uh, we're to try to explain that uh, museums can help us understand the other and see the other as well. So that's maybe one of the big uh, roles of cultural heritage uh, as a transformative, as, as a mind, to, um, as a um, helping to transform the minds, uh, um, which is quite important uh, now. And uh, throughout this project, of course, we'll be very interested to learn uh, the lessons that you've learned uh, through this project. So how one can do it if you want to replicate it. So what are the key ingredients of uh, this uh, uh, wonderful uh, approach? So thank you once again, and we we'll look forward to learning more. Maybe now, uh, before we uh, uh, start the next session, I can turn to our speakers uh, and for your quick uh, reactions and maybe thoughts and comments, and uh, maybe if you can share the ideas that um, uh, this presentation inspired. And maybe I can turn uh, first to uh, Doris Sommer, who is joining us from the United States. And thank you so much, Doris. It's pretty early for you now uh, there. Um, so Doris Sommer is Director of Cultural Agents Initiative at the Harvard University. Um, Doris, what, what are your thoughts on either or on the two uh, presentations that we just heard? Thank you so much. I'm delighted to, uh, to hear these presentations and uh, feel very, um, very happy to find um, close colleagues. Uh, first, I would like to uh, underline how important it is for us to all hear that culture is about innovation. We've heard so much about the importance of culture as heritage and uh, as attractions for tourism, for uh, economic development, but to think about culture as innovation uh, so that we make ourselves up again. That's what human beings do. We invent ourselves. We, uh, our societies are artificial and therefore open to improvement and to development. And to think uh, with Federico de la Pupa about uh, culture as a platform for uh, sociability is a way to reignite our um, 
our democratic uh, heritage. Uh, maybe I'll go back to that theme when, when I speak later. But if you think about the uh, cultural roots of Western democracy, uh, they start in Falun culture. Uh, they start when people meet informally across class lines uh, and, uh, and cultural lines. So I was delighted to think about an industrial landscape uh, turned into a uh, Salon city. And uh, I'm uh, eager to see how that develops. And with Giovanni Br uh, Brambilla, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to hear um, a philosophy like uh, Paulo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed land in so grand uh, a, a scene and so productive uh, a, a process. Uh, the, the simple change of a, a preposition about working uh, with people instead of for people uh, brings me back to Freire and it's uh, about uh, education in interaction and thinking about art as agora. Um, I'm uh, very excited really to, uh, to hear these, uh, these interventions. I don't wanna take any more time, but just express my uh, admiration and um, enthusiasm about collaborating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris, and we really look forward to your own presentation a bit later on in the session. If I may now um, turn to Charles Landry. Well, of course, you are a fellow at Robert Porsche Academy in Berlin, but you are most known for as a promoter of the creative city agenda for the last uh, decades. Charles, if we can hear your uh, reactions to the two case studies we've just heard. Um, hello, everybody, and delighted to see you. Well, the, the, the first thought that came out into my mind is really that psychology tells us not to erase, not to eliminate, not to negate who I am and where I come from. And rather like uh, Doris just said, what I liked was the whole thing was reflected towards the future. And people were not talking about culture and cultural heritage as aspect aspic, uh, frozen in aspic, but more about blending past, present and future together, the old and the new together. So working with the grain of what you've got and, and moving forward. Um, I particularly thought also quite interesting, or this thought came into my mind, that when we think of cultural tourism, we might think of an institution, a building, visiting a museum and all of that. And the way that all of this is being rethought, I mean, Giovanna obviously rethought it in a different way, not necessarily rethinking, but broadened it. But also what it came up to my mind in terms of cultural tourism is people are really focusing on the extraordinary every day. And if we take that notion of the extraordinary every day, that means that everywhere has a possibility because that extraordinary every day is in small places, big places, heritage places, all sorts of places. So I, I, I like that. Um, the other thing that I thought was implied a bit about how one rethinks, let's say, a museum or something, is that, of course, the digital turn enables many more possibilities because it flattens geography as well. So that's all I'll say for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And we do look forward to your own presentation later on as well. If I can now uh, turn to Egye Yildirim. Um, you are a heritage planner in Istanbul and you have been working with Ecomos uh, for quite a number of years. What's your reaction to these two case studies? <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Katya. Um, I I'm used to saying Katya to, to Ekaterina now. <laughs> um, again, uh, thank you for inviting uh, me as well and uh, very fascinating insights. Um, I think they were very um, powerful presentations from uh, Pieve di Soligo and, and uh, Bergamo. Um, a few questions that came um, to me um, as a heritage person, um, inevitably um, apologizing for any um, impression that heritage is not dynamic. I would like to say that in the heritage world now, we um, have realized we have to look at heritage as dynamic as well. It needs to be flexible and adapt to the times and look at, at the future, uh, linking the past and the future, which I'll also talk about. So the questions were um, this very provocative um, 
idea of degenerative de deconstruction um, and how land can be renovated in a cultural way. Um, that has a lot of implications for the circular economy. I think um, exploring the circular economy aspect is, is um, useful. Um, but also um, when you're renovating land, um, I wonder if you were looking at it with everything on the land, land and all of its ecosystem, let's say, um, the built ecosystem. And um, is the industrial heritage um, also part of this equation? Um, or are you talking about um, unused, obsolete and, um, you know, uh, areas of in, um, former industrial production that have no social cultural value anymore? So I think that's an, a, a provocative response, perhaps, to this provocative um, idea. And for Giovanna, um, the non-public was a very interesting idea about um, the disadvantaged community. It's eye-opening. And it makes one think of um, a very serious current um, issue of disadvantaged people of the migrants, you know, refugees and immigrants. So I suppose you also have that as part of your spectrum. I would, um, it would be interesting to hear uh, more about that. And also when you're saying, inclusion, not cohesion, accessibility, but welcome. Um, I chose to interpret that as the, the words that you're promoting are enhanced or more sophisticated versions. Um, inclusion is not a bad thing, but we need to go beyond inclusion. It's not enough. Um, and um, just access, providing access, um, as a dry and mechanic thing is not enough. You need to have a, an emotional welcoming component to it. So sometimes terminology can be misunderstood and I just wanted to check if that's the case with you. Um, that's um, all from me for now, not to take too much time. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And maybe we'll uh, go back to Giovanna and Federico at the end of this session, uh, once we've heard from the other speakers for a brief uh, response, reflection, comment on, on what you've heard as well. Uh, maybe I can now turn to Alessandro Corciata. Uh, well, you are an associate professor uh, uh, at the Grand Sasso Science Institute in L'Aquila. And L'Aquila is, of course, one of our uh, project uh, cities. Alessandro, uh, what are your thoughts um, after these two presentations that we've heard? Yes, just two brief comments. I really enjoyed the two presentation. Um, as for PVD Solida, uh, it's really interesting to note how also small villages are now ha has now a clear vision of what could be a culture-led development model and how to implement it. And as for um, the the Bergamo case studies. Is uh, quite interest, interesting to uh, to know that uh, they anchor their they, their vision to the Faro Convention. This is more or less more similar to my next talk. So welcome to this new, no, this, this new relevant and interesting approach. That's all. Yes, thank you so much, Alessandro. Maybe I can now turn to Florinda Saiva. I, I remember Florinda when you joined our webinar, it was a year ago, really, in the uh, really in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, um, and you are the founder of the Farm Cultural Park uh, in Italy, and uh, this uh, serves as an inspiration for many um, Italian cities, but uh, very much so for Europe and beyond. So what's your uh, reaction and comment and thoughts after these two presentations, please? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I understand the, uh, the, the mayor of uh, Pieve di, di Soligo because it's a, a very small town and uh, we are uh, a small, small town and uh, the heart sometimes is very important uh, to, to give a people a different, uh, uh, a different way to see the problem a different way uh, to to move something and uh, bergamo is a, a interest, interesting museum and uh, it shows us how the the culture can speak with the people and uh, sometimes the heart go out the museum and meet the people is a very interesting uh, experiment Yes, indeed, indeed. Thank you, Florinda. Um, if I can now turn to Bertram Nissen, you are president and scientific director of Kefare in Italy. What are your thoughts about these two experiences? 
Hello, everybody. So many interesting things have been already said by the other panelists, uh, and so it's, it's just a first turn. But I would like to focus mainly on some common points, let's say, more at a more political level, because both cases, I think that they highlight strategies, uh, practices, and duties that can be used for the implementation of uh, a new concept of culture of proximity. Uh, and this is exactly what we need today, because uh, we are witnessing the booming of new inequalities driven by the COVID-19. Uh, so I think that the two cases depict how it's possible to uh, integrate um, a more, let's say, traditional view of cultural heritage with a more uh, contemporary one. Uh, and I think that from this point of view, they can be also uh, framed in the general framework of, of social innovation on one side and cultural innovation on the other side. I think that uh, it, seen in this way, cultural heritage can be seen as a, a platform uh, for the development of local communities on one side uh, and also as a basis for uh, a more uh, genuine and real uh, cultural democracy. I can see that here probably the main point uh, is that they are both examples of how it's possible to translate different kinds of values within the territories uh, that connect uh, the heritage and people in many different ways at, uh, at many different levels. For now, it's enough. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, before we move to the next uh, session, uh, maybe let's turn to Federico and Giovanna for um, your final uh, remarks. And maybe, well, if you want to answer some of the questions that were raised by um, our colleagues, please. Well, maybe Federico. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm very happy because uh, our provocation <laughs> uh, uh, is um, is a provocation, but uh, also is a sort of uh, path for us, uh, because uh, um, we know that we have uh, uh, we have to think at uh, culture as a heritage. No, uh, um, maybe uh, um, usually. usually uh, we build uh, our uh, cultural pro cultural programs uh, uh, on our heritage, uh, but uh, for us, uh, uh, um, culture culture is not uh, the monuments; uh, uh, it, it is a provocation. This this one and uh, uh, culture uh, is people. Culture is a landscape, or culture is heritage, but not, but not only heritage. But we have to think at the future, and we we want to think uh, uh, how our land uh, will be uh, in uh, 2050. Uh, so um, we have to uh, define today our strategies to uh, build up our future uh, towards uh, the, the, the um, uh, toward our goals for the, uh, not, not for now or for the next year, but for the uh, next uh, 50 years, um, maybe, <laughs> uh, perhaps, uh, but, uh, uh, this this uh, is, is is our uh, challenge. So um, um, I think that uh, uh, your comments um, are very important for us uh, because uh, they uh, underline um, many specific points that we can. Uh, include in our uh, future uh, discussion and plans. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, comments. Well, thank you. And uh, maybe now Giovanna. Uh, okay. Well, I think that there were uh, two questions. One was about migrants. And uh, uh, I'm quite proud to say that last year we received the United Nations Awards uh, Welcome working for refugee um, integration as uh, we have um, 
an agreement uh, with an association that works with refugees and migrants in the town. And uh, our museum is a place uh, to start to build a new um, working ability for uh, these people. And uh, now in the exhibition, Regina, we have uh, two people who ask uh, uh, the status to refugee uh, to our country. Of course, they are still waiting for the documents uh, and uh, for all this sort of uh, uh, process uh, to be organized, but they are in the museum as warden of the collection. And uh, every time I enter the collection with a group of people, um, I always uh, introduce them to the people and explain that they are here with us uh, as uh, a mark of what uh, kind of society we, we would like to have. And they're not just only warden, but uh, um, they received uh, um, a, a training about the exhibition, they are involved in the study of the artist uh, uh, in the way that they are not there just as sort of wardens, but they become part of the policy of the museum. Um, from on the other side, we were the first Italian museum to create this sort of professional uh, figure of a museum mediators as we organize a course uh, for people coming from very different countries like uh, Iran or um, China or Japan, uh, Hungary. And uh, these people has been uh, trained uh, to work with us uh, to share a knowledge as I think that museum uh, is a place of constant negotiation of the meanings and of the meaning of the items. So uh, we share with them uh, our knowledge about our history and they share with us all the knowledge about uh, uh, arts and culture and they help is always pressure in, pressures in all the exhibition and they are paid um, to welcome and to come with people coming from different countries in the museum. And all the people that come with them in the museum has got a free entry. And uh, don't think that Chinese uh, mediator bring Chinese people or Hungarian educator bring uh, Hungarian people. For an example, the lady from Hungarian, which is Anita, uh, teaches Italian in a school for migrants. Uh, and so she takes migrants coming from the Maghreb or from the Latin America in museum, uh, making the tour in Italian. So museum is a place uh, of sharing knowledge, learning languages, and, uh, uh, and it's not very easy. So the first thing you have to do uh, is uh, uh, to show people the um, uh, road to the museum, even before entering, to say that they are welcome, and they are really welcome to say that there are no um, Nobody's gonna ask their documents because you can enter without any identity card or passport. And we have been working with the second generation as well. People, the second generation has been involved in a theory project and they rewrite the catalog of the collection. And if someone is interested, I'm sorry, unfortunately, it's just in Italian, but I can provide with a PDF of this catalog. They use the same format, the shape, pages and image of the official catalog of the exhibition and of the collection and rewrite it uh, according to their idea and interpretation, which is not a uh, Rorschach spot, but uh, really they went deeper into, into the artwork. And if we think, uh, I, I think, I mean, it's my personal idea, of course, thinking about the use of terms that we did, which was the second answer, the second question, uh, I think that museums have to stop asking why people is not uh, um, coming. I think that they have to start asking why questions themselves about uh, how people should come because they have been places of exclusion for so many times and some of them are still like this. So I think that museum has to go out of their building, uh, meeting people, uh, trying to understand and know and listen to people uh, because working with uh, is very different from working for. If you work for, you stay in your building. If you work with, uh, 
you meet people. And if you if we think of the, I know that it's in discussion a new uh, definition of museum uh, with uh, ECOM now, but the Seoul exhibition, which is uh, like a sort of mantra for all the professional of museum, says that museum is a permanent institution in the service of society and the development open to the public. And so if we, I, I would like to stress that the definition think uh, uh, speaks before about people, society, items comes later. So I think that the focus of a museum has to be the individuals and the communities and the cohesion, because unless we reach these goals, uh, uh, items uh, are unseen, uh, rooms are desert uh, and museum is a deposit. I hope to Yes, thank you so much. Well, I will be also very interested to learn uh, much more about these mediators and how you work with them, how you set up this whole program, because uh, clearly it uh, looks like something that uh, can be uh, an inspiration for many places, for many museums, uh, hopefully. So with this, I thank you, uh, Giovanna, and I thank Federico, and I um, now it's uh, over to you, Pierluigi, for the next uh, session. So thank you to our speakers, and uh, now we'll hear the lessons learned from international experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katia. And uh, thank you also for uh, already introducing this uh, fantastic panel of speakers. I think that uh, these lessons from the international experiences have to be properly framed uh, also in the context of the work that the OECD is doing, uh, specifically on uh, culture-led development models. And, um, and in particular, also looking at, uh, at uh, as we already mentioned, to the new, uh, not only lessons learned, but really strategies that uh, are deriving from the pandemic crisis. I take this opportunity also to remind to our uh, audience that um, as OECD, we published a note, uh, a, a note on the actual reactions from uh, different uh, local constituencies to the pandemic crisis in the cultural field. The note is called Culture Shock, and it's not just a, a review of uh, what has been uh, done so far, but especially about uh, the new uh, possible opportunities for systematic innovation that spring from uh, the reaction to the pandemic crisis. And I think that to a large extent, what we will hear from the international panel today is very much about that. It's also important to stress that um, the OECD uh, has taken a systematic approach. So it's not just to the cultural field, but really the cultural field in reaction with so many different uh, uh, stakeholders and policy points of view that have to do, of course, uh, with, the, with the economy, the employment, the social development, the regional development, and of course, tourism, as has already been mentioned. So it's very important that we are just uh, widening uh, our regard uh, from the point of view of uh, the global system of interconnection. So what, how culture is part of a most complex ecosystem in which uh, cultural uh, value at uh, the social or economic value is, uh, is deployed in ways that can really help us overturn the current crisis and the blockages. I think that uh, our uh, panel of speakers is ideal from this point of view, both in terms of their solid backgrounds in the field, but also in terms of the concrete uh, experience and experimentation that they are uh, currently developing. And so I'm really pleased to start uh, with a dear friend and colleague with Doris Sommer. I think that um, Doris has made uh, an incredible work in uh, uh, experimenting with uh, local uh, culture-led local development strategies, especially in the global south. And since I think that the Global South today, and I'm not alone in, in this thinking, is probably the most exciting and the most progressive and forward-looking area of experimentation of advanced cultural practices, I'm particularly happy to give the floor to her for the presentation titled Play Drive in the Hard Drive Participatory Arts and Social Inclusion. Doris, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm uh, very happy to follow on uh, the, the presentations that we heard. You already heard my enthusiasm for them. And I hope that my new colleagues uh, will find my presentation um, in, um, in sync with theirs. Um, I wonder if I can share my screen. Um, 
just so that I have, um, uh, that I know uh, when, when I wanna push the button. Okay, so play drive is a word that was invented by um, Friedrich Schiller. Schiller was a poet whose name you probably know. He was also a philosopher and, um, and a very close disciple of Immanuel Kant. And what he uh, discovered, as many great innovators discover, is a, a lack of vocabulary for what needs to be done. Uh, good artists and good philosophers ask themselves, uh, what is missing? And when he was living through the terror of the French Revolution, when he had always been a revolutionary and had his heart broken because people's heads were literally rolling in the street, he said, what is the problem here? What, why has the revolution gone so violent? He said, well, the revolutionaries um, know that reason is a, uh, an important uh, human faculty but they think it's the only human faculty that's worth defending. So anyone who is not reasonable uh, gets his head cut off. And he thought about our human faculties. One is reason, another is passion. The revolutionaries were not keeping uh, sensation together. Uh, they, they were forgetting the human body. But if you think of the human condition as reason on one side and passion on the other, we are little civil wars who walk around all day. What is it that keeps us from imploding? What, keep, what is it that keeps us from making war in ourselves all the time? And he decided that that capacity to make new forms, to bring us out of conflicts between reason and passion is called the play drive, the Spieltrieb. And I'm very pleased to know that Spieltrieb is a common word now in German, uh, but people have forgotten that Schiller made it up. A good artist sees what's missing and adds it. So we all have a Spieltrieb. That's why I call this uh, play drive in the hard drive. If you're human, it's because you know how to imagine something differently. The, the world exists, um, but it doesn't have to exist in the same way because we all have a capacity to intervene, to try something new, to uh, progress the way science progresses and art progresses through trial and error. Uh, the great contributions that we just heard in the former panel, um, I can suspect that they were developed over uh, a period of um, experimentation, conversation, trial and error. This first visual that I have here uh, is from Bogota, Colombia, when Bogota was the most violent, chaotic city uh, in Latin America, probably in the world. Uh, and the new mayor, who had no, uh, no practice, no background as a political leader, um, was stuck. Uh, he didn't know what to do. And he said to his uh, minister of culture, he said, um, come up with an idea. And the minister of culture said, nothing to be done, boss. It's time to bring out the clowns. So the new mayor, instead of being offended, as any normal person would, he said, OK, it's a good idea. And he brought out 20 pantomime artists to intervene in traffic, which was killing people every day on the streets. And the citizens of Bogota were much more concerned with looking ridiculous in front of these mimes than with paying, um, paying fines, because the fines were paid off in, um, in, corrupt, um, in corrupt gifts to, uh, to policemen. So this was the icebreaker of a series of interventions in Bogota that managed in 10 years to reduce the homicide rate by 70%. It increased income through taxes by 300%. And one thing that I want to share uh, with, um, with colleagues, um, and you already know uh, this importance, people who have spoken, is the importance to measure cultural interventions. It's not enough just to make them, uh, we need to measure them. And that's one reason that I appreciate so much uh, working with Pierluigi, because when we have friendly economists, we have a way to make art count, literally count. So here are just some, uh, some sequels in Venezuela, the mimes looked like this. 
in Bolivia, they look like this because zebra uh, means crosswalk in Spanish because of the, of the stripes. And when people get used to seeing a mime on the street, they're no longer interesting. The charm of art is surprise, which brings us to a conversation. Uh, that's why I was um, so much enjoying the theme of sociability that we heard in the former panel. And these are um, paid traffic cops, but now turned into um, literally into zebras. Here's a, a visual that I wanted to share because it appears in the um, UN guides for uh, inclusive cities. It is not at all commented in that guide. Art appears as decoration in that guide, not as a, um, a practice to theorize, to comment on. This is from a, a town which had a great um, violence uh, challenge in Mexico, Pachuca. It's about a couple of hours outside of Mexico City. And um, a, a few mural artists came into town and designed with the residents uh, a mural that is the size of the whole city. And the statistics are phenomenal. Within one year, the uh, violence went down by 30% and it continued to decrease. Uh, I don't know if, the, if the studies are continuing, uh, but um, I wanted to show you this as so far a missed opportunity for um, UN discourse. Uh, here's uh, probably one of the inspirations. You, you may recognize this as Tirana Albania, the current um, prime minister of Albania, Edi Rama, is a painter. He was uh, mayor of uh, Tirana for three, um, three administrations, and then he was elected prime minister because of the monumental changes he made in the capital city through paint. When he, he says in a TED talk that I recommend, um, paint is structural. It makes people feel differently about their city. It gives pride. It, it, uh, it solves uh, crime problems, uh, litter problems, conservation problems. People love their city. They love each other. They love themselves. Uh, this kind of sociability that, uh, that arises from color uh, is something that Eddie Rama taught um, many of us. Uh, here's something close to, uh, to you in Rome. Uh, I'm learning about opera trucks. Great artists uh, come out of the theaters and put on professional um, pr productions in uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods. And my favorite sequel to this uh, are the children's choirs. This is called the Rainbow Chorus in uh, Sicily. What a way to integrate um, immigrant children with local children, uh, heritage uh, in uh, the Massimo Theater in, uh, in uh, Palermo with uh, new singers. And the way I want to um, uh, finish my, my brief uh, talk and then just say a word about sociability is that those children are pointing a finger at you. You are the change. Everyone has a play drive, as I said, uh, we can make change. Art is for participation. I didn't have to bring this up. The former panel uh, did a much uh, uh, appreciated uh, and grounded presentation of that idea. And we are all artists. That was also in the former presentation. So I want to invite people and we can, um, we can uh, repeat this invitation on chat to a meeting that uh, we're hosting uh, several of us, myself, Pierluigi, Charles, Ege, and um, several other people, to a working meeting that we're calling Art is a Game Changer for Societal Challenges. It's targeted at artists, at cultural workers, and at policymakers in general. We all have challenges in policy. And if we look at the um, UN SDGs, what I'm learning from my uh, applied science friends is that systems thinking is necessary even to look at that chart of SDGs. Each one of those uh, objectives depends on all the others. You cannot have potable water 
without gender equity, without jobs, without reducing poverty, without education. You cannot have education without potable water, without gender equity, without jobs. So every place we want to intervene is a structural intervention. If we work at a museum, if we work at an uninhabited industrial building, if we work in a classroom as I do teaching language and literature, every one of us is uh, a point on this um, Ouija board, on this acupuncture uh, um, body, which is the world now. Every place we press, we uh, affect everyone else. So those children are pressing those, uh, their fingers at us. And I'm so happy to be in this, um, in this row of, uh, of pre uh, presenters. As I say, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, collaborations with, um, with the presenters that we've already heard. I'll stop here. Uh, but first, I, I, I do want to say something about sociability. I have been asking my colleagues who are good theorists of politics, if anyone has been writing about the way that democracy depends on sociability. Because if we don't enjoy talking to one another, we don't talk to one another. If we know the answer to political problems before we come into a session, we don't have a debate. We don't know how to deliberate. And the way to prime a deliberation is to develop skills for sociability. That's the way the Enlightenment uh, kicked off uh, democracy. Today in the United States, I don't think this is happening in Europe yet, but it certainly happened in uh, Japan. Today in the United States, we are losing our programs in the humanities. People who had tenure are losing their jobs. Whole departments of the humanities are being eliminated because people don't know what the humanities are good for. I think we have an opportunity to tell people, to uh, demonstrate to people what the humanities are good for. Beyond art, art is about making, but what we saw in uh, both examples in the previous panel is that art is also a platform for talking about making, for be uh, becoming a community together. And those are skills that we learn through the humanities, interpreting art, talking about it, sparring, debating just for the pleasure of it. Uh, so I want to make a, um, a pitch here for including humanistic education along with art uh, as um, social uh, contributions. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you so much, Doris. That was uh, really illuminating in many different regards. And uh, I want to stress in particular the focus that you gave on the importance of uh, play and, and the, the, the playful dimension of culture as an essential component of our uh, human nature, which is so important to stress that the, the usual relationship with uh, uh, which is generally established between uh, culture and the superfluous, something that has not to do with basic needs, that has not to do with primary concerns of humans, is uh, so misleading in this regard. So we, we, we are really have to recover the essential uh, behavioral change dimension that is related to cultural experience as a way to really cope with our uh, societal environmental challenges in a completely new way. You, you gave us uh, really illuminating examples, and in particular, this role of the humanities is important to stress because, uh, again, in, there is an instrumental way of looking at culture for which, uh, I mean, you evaluate, for example, uh, humanities uh, training as something that is immediately gets or gets not some uh, specific market recognition. But the real point is that without uh, this kind of knowledge, we are not really able to understand some of the fine-grained dimensions of our uh, societal challenges. So thank you so much for reminding us uh, about this and in, in a sense, even the European call for action related to the new European Bauhaus is very much about that. So I think we have a powerful convergence from this point of view of different perspectives in this regard. And now I turn to, to Charles Landry. Well, Charles is an institution 
in the in the creative cities agenda and program i mean he's been working and consulting worldwide for decades so he has probably an unmatched experience in terms of how culture can really change uh, urban and not only urban context. And uh, so when Charles says anywhere can maximize cultural resources for regeneration, I feel particularly energized by this. So Charles, what's your take? <laughs> well, I hope I can give you energy. Let's see. Um, when I was asked your big question about culture, cultural heritage and cohesion, I thought to myself, what are some transformative experiences I have had myself, which I believe are about recovery? And here are three. And you might ask, what the hell ha has this to do with COVID recovery in Italian cities? Well, perhaps nothing and perhaps everything, because all have to do with what we have lost and what we can gain, especially overcoming stress, bringing people together, reinforcing belonging and identity, and imagining what next together, but also doing unusual things, thinking sidewards, being imaginative. And the first is the District 6 Museum in Cape Town. I went there, it's in a Baptist church, but most importantly, around the area in apartheid, a whole community of tens of thousands of people was just eradicated effectively and taken 12 kilometers away to a place called Langa. So what, how did they rebuild this? This Baptist church did a map of all the streets and everybody who had lived there through time could place their name and a little square of where they had lived. And over time, this grew and grew and grew. And this texture, you could call it even a tapestry, but it was little uh, images on the floor, grew and grew. And of course, when people went there, the focus of attention, obviously those who had been, lived there before was uh, astonishing, but also those who had never really understood what all of these breakages were about that we associate with the then South Africa. Now, of course, it's a key visitor attraction. The second I experienced is something called the Museum of Broken Relationships, which initiated was initiated from Zagreb in, in Croatia. And what it's about is things I learned about heartbreak. And it's not a museum in the traditional sense, it spreads throughout the world. In the meantime, it's been in 41 cities and I saw it in Helsinki. And I have never been to an exhibition where there was so much attention paid to the people. Everybody was looking at these objects that were left there by the community. They gave the objects that represented heartbreak. So there was one, a very big jar where a wedding dress was stuffed into it. Another was a tube of toothpaste that a couple had jointly used. The point here is not only about heartbreak, but it's how it's put together. Who is the curator in this sense? It's anyone who had an experience and they wanted to show something symbolic and meaningful to them. So that was the second experience that I felt taught me something. The third was the Gama Festival in Arnhem Land in Australia. Arnhem Land is up there really where you still really see and experience Aboriginal uh, uh, culture. And it was really a festival reconceived. It was not just music, etc., but a collaborative learning experience about building relationships, especially young Aborigines connecting to other Australians and any foreigners who might have been there. So those three experiences to me somehow have relevance to what we're talking about. Obviously, I could have talked about the obvious thing, you know, oh, create a building, do something interesting, put an incubator unit in it, uh, get artists and uh, new tech people to be together. Of course, there's a lot of that and we know that, but that is well trodden that the ground. So back to Italy and smaller places. My own experiences has been, let's say, in Ch Chataldo, dealing with something to do with the wood industry, Arezzo, obviously, to do with gold, and Matera being involved in the European capital of culture. 
and I know Favara well, thank God, thank God I know it well. But what strikes me is there are so many Italian models. What always strikes me about Italy, there are so many interesting things, but why have they not become the normal when you think of interesting bureaucratic things that happen, but that doesn't seem to change the system. But let's forget that. But looking at Italian models, one that I think can be adapted conceptually to the culture driven approach is really the slow cities movement. And I've been to many of those sm small cities that are part of the Italian network. And for me, there's a model there of validating, valuing and adding value to a place and local culture. So why do I think that? I think it is in these, obviously it focuses on smaller places and I'm thinking of the best of its members. But what you can see here is a common project. It brings people together. It has a mission. It has a goal. It is working with traditions in a sense, valuing what is there, the cultural resources, but it is also future focused and tech aware. But importantly, we all, I hope we all like the word slow rather than fast, because that uh, obviously enables reflection and that is what the future needs. And the more I'm doing my uh, little work, the more I can hear people saying, Let's do this with a paced and purposeful approach. Let's have incrementalism with intent. And a couple of our examples shown earlier in the session were precisely about that. Strategically opportunistic, but incremental with an intent. Now, well, of course, the pandemic wake up call has shaken us all. It triggered a dawning of humility it created both clarity and confusion, but importantly, it brought us back to the essentials. And the essentials are essentially, I'm repeating myself, what we have or could have. So heritage and contemporary culture, obviously here we see it as a way of life, a landscape, a building, cultural activity, participation, all of that. And so that brings me back to the point I mentioned earlier in response to the other presentations. I really like the idea of revaluing the extraordinary every day. And now what does that mean for cultural institutions and so on? I think it means spreading seamlessly physically into surrounding environments and obviously outreach programs and all of that as well. So those two things are important and perhaps for too long, people have asked, what is the value of culture, cultural heritage, art forms, participatory art, and so on? I think the question now is one of confidence, that one should address all of this with far greater confidence and say, not that person who's asked you what is the value of, because that puts you on the defensive. You have to get all your evidence together, and I'm not against evidence. Um, they are not challenging themselves, that person who's asking. But what we should ask them, what is the value, what is the cost rather of not valuing culture? Give me the reasoning why. And I found in my own work that switching that question has been quite powerful. And when I think of great places, whether a tiny, small, bigger, mega places or so, there seem to be five big issues and all of them, arts and culture can have a decisive role in making it happen. And I think these five elements are great places are places of anchorage, i.e. what do I have, where do I come from, all of that, the familiar and so on. A place of connection and communication. How do I bond and link both locally, more widely, and into the wider world. How can I ha have a place of opportunity and ambition? And again, obviously the arts plays a role in prefiguring these possibilities. And fourthly, ever important than before, is these great places are places of nurture and nourishment. And these nurturing and nourishing environments, of course, build on the things I've just said before, I think the three things. And perhaps finally, it is great places are places of inspiration and imagination. 
And I suppose that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charles. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, there were many, many elements in your, uh, in your presentation and picture, but I would like to stress especially what I could uh, briefly describe as the power of us. So there is this idea that really, I mean, we need to shift perspective. That was already very clear in Doris' presentation, but we really need to shift perspective from a notion of culture that has been uh, regulated and in institutionalized in terms of uh, certain forms of gatekeeping that have been uh, instrumental, I think, for, uh, for Western culture in the 19th and 20th century, but that really today uh, need a different, uh, a different logic to be, to be implemented. When you mentioned the Museum of Broken Relationships, that was really interesting. I visited the museum and what, what, what I was really touched by in that case was that clearly there was a curatorial hand so to speak, but literally that was a, a, such a powerful uh, amplification and networking of so many private experiences and perspectives in which I sometimes it was really challenging for people to offer uh, that particular object or their particular personal memory to a collective endeavor. There was even uh, somebody who, who offered the so suicide note of uh, his or her mother. And that I know we can really imagine what is at stake there. So the fact that a museum can gain that level of trust, that level of recognition to be considered the custodian of uh, these objects that maybe for someone else could not be so meaningful, but for these people really are a matter of life and death, literally. This really means that there is another way to catalyze today the energies and the and the, the tensions for uh, for 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 uh, for change and transformation that people are uh, in some sense uh, heading to uh, but that uh, sometimes is frustrated by conventional approaches i think that um, yeah what you what you said was very clear there is practically no place that can shy away from the idea that they are not uh, a credible theater for cultural regeneration so the real problem becomes uh, how and why and through what means. And I think that um, this is where uh, we are making some, uh, uh, this is towards where we are making some interesting steps today. And uh, I also think that, um, again, this is the, probably the beginning of a new cycle. So it's, it's also important to understand um, how this language can really become not only an attractive language for uh, those parts of the civil society who are increasingly recognizing this potential, but for the policymakers that sometimes still remain anchored to very traditional notions of uh, policy relevance of very traditional notions of realistic objectives and sometimes tend to, uh, in some sense, to skip the truly transformational potential of uh, involving uh, from, uh, I mean, in the deepest possible sense, a community in this kind of collective endeavor. So thanks so much. Oh, do you want to add something, Charles? One sentence, um, Pierre Luigi, if you might, if you don't mind. Um, uh, I just uh, the other day saw Helsinki's Arts and Culture 2030 strategy, and I think it encapsulates a lot of what we're saying in one sentence quite beautifully. Arts as a discipline helps the city know itself and to imagine alternative worlds and to build paths to the future. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Charles. And no, I, what, what is beautiful, but also frustrating of this panel is that every single presentation could be the start of a very, very rich thread that uh, I unfortunately cannot really follow up to, to, to where I would like to. But still, I mean, I hope that this gives us a further hunger for uh, more reflection and more uh, constructive thinking on the topic. But now it's time to turn to Ege Ilderim. So Ege is a heritage planner as, as was underlined, but is really, I think a, a dynamic force in terms of uh, proposing a, a truly transformational vision in the sometimes difficult world of heritage professionals that uh, are not necessarily the most ready to embrace these new perspectives that sometimes tend to play a bit defensive. So I'm really, really happy to give the floor, uh, to the screen to Ege for her presentation, Cultural and Heritage in the Recovery, Lessons from International Networks and Local Responses. Ege, the screen is yours. 
Thank you so much, Pierre Luigi. I'm um, too flattered and humbled, but I will try to live up to all of this uh, expectation. And um, Charles finished with inspiration and imagination, and that is what I took from his um, and Doris's presentation. So it'll be a hard act to follow. I will do my best. Um, I need to share my screen. Uh, by, uh, in the, by the way, um, can I be uh, authorized to do that? Yes. Now I am. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, Pierre Luigi, can you see me and hear me all right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So um, I will um, try to share some relevant points um, for Italian heritage cities and um, other cities who are um, with us today, um, uh, but I'm not sure what, um, uh, I can really add to a very high level of awareness and good practice already, but um, I have been involved um, in the international heritage and also culture advocacy circles in the past years, um, as, as was mentioned. Uh, it's an honor to be here, of course. Thank you for inviting me, OECD Local and Pierluigi um, and team. Um, and so uh, some of these international um, principles um, are of course applied to local situations and the local responses, how they actually make any sense on the ground, um, uh, makes them come alive. So I will try to share a selection of um, points that I thought um, would be particularly useful today. Uh, just reminding ourselves that it's the uh, International Year of the Creative Economy for Sustainable Development at the UN this year. It's an opportunity for you know um, engaging with that theme at uh, various levels of events. There was just one for um, the day of cultural diversity um, last week on May 21st. Um, and this is uh, good to just note down as we start um, um, this theme. So um, I'm a member and former focal point of the uh, International Council on Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS, Sustainable Development Goals uh, Working Group. Um, you may know ECOMOS is uh, one of the advisors of UNESCO for World Heritage, but we are also an NGO civil society network of he cultural heritage experts. And uh, we develop doctrine on how heritage could be should be uh, pr preserved, managed, promoted. Um, and increasingly, um, our work in the SDGs Working Group is um, as Pierre Luigi said, uh, challenging our notions, and we realize we have to transform ourselves. And the SDGs are, of course, uh, a great framework to, uh, to do that. Um, and uh, for the past um, more than a decade now, um, the doctrine has started to go around how heritage is more than just monuments. It has to be an evolving resource. Um, as per the theme of, of today, um, it supports identity and cohesion and uh, sense of belonging and many other um, socioeconomic factors, environmental resilience factors. Um, so, and as Doris said, it's all connected to each other. And heritage is everywhere as is culture. And uh, we have one anchorage of the 11.4 target in the SDGs under the urban goal. But increasingly in our work, we see that um, all of the goals have some relevance for us. Um, and uh, the definition of uh, cultural heritage is expanding. Um, the culture nature connection, the people connection, um, <clears throat> Sorry, we created this um, special icon. You see the green one um, below the SDGs icons, uh, which tries to capture all these elements in it. Um, and also about communicating with unconventional sectors that heritage is not used to communicating with, new partnerships, and also reconceptualizing change um, in, in terms of risk management and resilience. Um, and COVID-19 was a very interesting test for us, how heritage um, can contribute um, as a grounding mental and uh, well-being force for people to turn to in these times. Um, so th uh, these are some of the uh, points that Heritage is reaching out into sustainability. And um, I, I was interested to see in the con concept note of today, um, this sentence on reconsidering growth models. Um, and uh, I wanted to um, spend some time on this I, um, because it is interesting in, in, and may, it, it does have um, ties to social cohesion or social peace and dialogue as well about the um, extreme focus and sometimes obsession on the word growth. And um, growth we see still in the UN and a lot of the documents, uh, policy documents as a you know, basic terminology, but actually, can we go beyond it? Um, growth, not development, growth, not uh, well-being, um, and um, trying to measure um, sustainable development success in some other terms. And um, there have started to be some models that um, have been 
in question now about the happiness index or um, not in, intangible factors of, of um, a better life, quality of life. Um, and here um, I'm referring to um, some excerpts from the new um, policy guidance at ECOMOS that we produced, uh, Mia and um, four other colleagues, uh, two Italian ladies among them, Ilario Rosetti, Francesca Giliberto, um, I'd like to salute them here. And the main message of this policy guidance was harness the power of heritage to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. And um, in the SDG 1, 8, and 12 sections, there are uh, references to how we can reinterpret uh, growth um, in terms of avoiding mono economies, um, depending too much on one sector, going, going beyond financial growth measures and GDP, um, and uh, also talk about a vulnerable um, uh, groups, um, demographic groups, um, who, who um, need to be in considered in terms of the equity uh, question. Um, and uh, the inclusive economic development um, is one that's defined as favoring people, people-centered. We've been hearing about the importance of people, so there it comes again. Um, then I'd like to move on from ECOMOS um, in terms of in what's going on internationally in terms of the into the Rome Charter, um, which focuses on cultural rights. Um, human rights are indeed part of the SDGs, the philosophy, leaving no one behind. And in terms of culture, this is also a human right. Um, and cultural rights um, are an increasingly important um, topic in the conversation. Um, the right to discover culture, create um, our own culture and ex expressions, share them, enjoy them, and protect them. Um, these are all defined in uh, the new Rome Charter of um, 2020. Uh, UCLG, the United Cities Local Governments, um, has been spearheading this, um, this process. Um, I think it's noteworthy here. Um, UCLG is, uh, and ECOMOS are also a par um, part of another campaign, the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, um, and with uh, several other international cultural networks, uh, we are um, advocating for a standalone cultural goal in the next iteration of the UN agenda. Uh, there is a statement, Culture COVID-19, um, statement which you can endorse so please you're all welcome to um, go online to this website and endorse it and, and this is um, calling on all actors to act uh, in protecting um, culture and placing it at the center of the recovery package so a lot of um, main um, points that we've, uh, we've been discussing are um, also here um, and I would like to here suddenly dive into um, a locality um, a, in Istanbul, um, because last year in, in the Culture uh, 2030 Goal Campaign high-level event uh, um, at the UN um, SDGs Forum, um, I wanted to show the slide, and um, I was not allowed to uh, name Hagia Sophia because of uh, national political reasons. I mean. I'm sure you're all following what's been happening in the Hagia Sophia in the last year. It's been re um, converted into a mosque um, while it was a, a museum since the 1930s as an equidistant place to the all um, kinds of religions and cultures, a universally inclusive place. Now it's more politically charged. So heritage can be um, misused, let's say, or can be the, the topic of division or um, um, you know, um, a, a lot of dispute. Um, and it, it does... Um, embody risk in it. And I think engaging in that darker side um, and um, actually ownership of the positive potential of heritage and um, you know, you know ha rather than letting it slide into these kinds of um, hateful or divisive politics, I think this is a lesson it, it gives us. And I, um, I quoted here um, my friend Zeynep Talayar who said on Instagram, I won't read the whole thing. She just says, her holy wisdom has always been like medicine for me and my city. And this has been the case since 1500 years, and it will continue to be so after we're all long gone. So she was very much inspired by um, a, an important um, heritage monument. And I think this is what, what the kind of thing that um, it should give us, um, I suppose. Um, now I'm moving on into um, the, the climate um, and heritage connection. Uh, the Climate Heritage Network is uh, working to bring together culture, arts, heritage organizations um, in uh, different um, spheres, local governments, public um, sector, um, private um, businesses, NGOs. Um, everybody's welcome to join this as well. And uh, lots of important advocacy um, happening and toward COP26 this year. There was a seminal report, The Future of Our Past, Engaging Cultural Heritage and Climate Action um, that was issued last year. Um, 
and I'm moving quickly because I, I think I'm going to fill up my 10 minutes very soon. Um, in terms of climate and um, cultural heritage, um, I'd like to also report on um, a recent event that uh, took place with the Global Parliament of Mayors um, on April 20th. Here we had the mayor of Palermo, uh, Leo Luca Orlando, giving a lot of great insights on dealing with migrants' heritage and how here heritage has to be conceived of something uh, that can be reconfigured to re reinvent a new we, you know, something that includes the migrants' culture and heritage and identity and gives them a place, a presence, a cultural presence, um, an identity, a voice, an agency. So these are all also heritage topics now, um, uh, encouraging a common cultural feature and um, looking at cultural heritage both as um, a tool to address climate action, also to protect it as a vulnerable um, asset that is threatened by climate um, change and climate change is bringing more and more migration actually so climate induced migration again uh, this is a, a topic um, that needs to be considered in this context of social cohesion um, Another local case study for you, I went back into um, my distant past when I was working um, um, in Ankara in Turkey um, with um, a project that brought together Bari, one of the Italian heritage cities here, uh, with um, the ancient city um, of Mura, where the St. Nicholas Church, the original one, uh, is located and which the new San Nicola di Bari um, Basilica, the newer one from <laughs> the, the many centuries ago now, um, was actually um, based on, and uh, there was actually uh, an intercultural um, exchange project there, uh, not only with it, with Italy and Turkey, but also with the, with Greece and Turkey uh, because of the Hagios Nikolaos, of course, um, the, the the personality. So heritage is an international cultural diplomacy tool. I think this is very valid for um, for Italy um, in the middle of the old world, the Mediterranean civilization, of course. Um, here, I'm just listing the SDG, some of the SDGs that it was particularly relevant for. Um, and then going into um, my very recent um, case study where I was site manager, this little Silk Road town of um, Mudurnu in Turkey. And uh, Charles already mentioned um, the slow city movement, also the slow food movement, Chita Slow. Um, Mudurno has become a Chita Slow as well. So uh, thank you to the Italian Chita Slow Network for um, giving this gift to the world. It's very popular. And I think the lesson here, um, after many years of trying to um, develop cultural heritage led sustainable tourism and sustainable development, it's been a huge challenge. Um, the small, it's such a small town with very little support and resources. I think the UNESCO World Heritage nomination that we undertook, which has not yet been successful, it may not be ever, um, versus the Chita Slow effort, I would vote for Chita Slow today. I think Chita Slow is so much more valid for um, all kinds of cities, um, small cities as well. It brings together culture, heritage, and other kinds of quality of life indicators. So it's much more a mainstream um, kind of um, set of criteria. And speaking of mainstreaming, um, we just need to, um, I would, uh, need to start concluding and say um, we need an integrated policy framework bringing together um, the climate and sustainability challenges with culture, people and their culture and heritage. It's a two-way process. We need to also advocate um, into the heritage world the sustainability and um, resilience and climate action um, debates. And uh, the lessons learned, um, I tried to put a few important points for you putting culture a catalyzing force as a central theme in policymaking, prioritizing, and financing. It is a dynamic tool if you like, if you want it to be. Um, it can be used for dialogue. It can be the basis of a common future in what we all together value. Um, it's a resource for climate action, uh, and we can amplify our actions through networks and peer learning and growing body of evidence and knowledge and localizing at different levels um, toward the localization of the SDGs. And here are um, some events that you can continue to this, um, have this discussion soon in Izmir um, and uh, in the Renaissance Now event that was already mentioned. Thank you, and I'm so sorry for taking more time than I should have. Um, thanks for your patience, everybody. Um, thanks, Pierre Luigi. Thanks so much, Ege. And I think uh, you gave us a, a very impressive uh, proof that uh, one of the issues in which uh, it's been traditionally more difficult to see the connection between uh, culture and the biggest societal challenges, which is exactly environmental and climate change. 
really is at the heart of the matter. And in particular, this also means that um, what has been experimented in uh, inclusive uh, participation processes in culture and the heritage domain in particular can really be a guide in many different respects in terms of how to negotiate uh, joint local and uh, cohesive local action on certain issues. Again, a very, very powerful demonstration of the power of, um, of culture to elicit behavioral change in pro-social ways. That is generally considered a dilemma in traditional social sciences because of these elements of meaning that are so important in the eliciting human uh, highly pro-social cooperation are often missing from the picture. So in some sense, if you don't really take a fully cultural perspective, it's very difficult to understand why societies or local communities could effectively manage or take all these kind of issues. But you gave us really, really powerful examples of how this can happen in very, in very, in very clear ways. So thank you so much, Eke, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And now I'll turn to my friend and colleague, uh, Alessandro Crociata. Uh, and and uh, Alessandro will uh, present us uh, exactly one case of a small community in our common home region of Abruzzo in Fontecchio, very close to L'Aquila, which gives us uh, a very, very striking and simple at the same time, it's strikingly simple example in his effectiveness of how a local community can really uh, adopt a transformational approach to, to social change through heritage. Alessandro, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bernardo Luigi. Thank you, SCD, for having me here. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Not yet. Can you see it? Uh, not yet for some reason. Let me try again. Maybe Alessandro, you can share a window. Okay, now some yeah. sharing is, is in progress. Okay, there we go. Well, as Luigi said, I will present uh, these studies. It is in Fontecchio, in the province of L'Aquila and Abruzzo region. The outline of my talk is uh, divided in organizing three uh, basic moments about what and what we mean from social cohesion and what role for culture in social cohesion. Well, uh, in uh, such topics, how can be developed in uh, in uh, peripheral areas. And so talking about how, I will give some, my opinion on the, the importance of planning framework to develop or to achieve such goal. Uh, social cohesion has a, a huge meaning, uh, uh, a huge extension of meaning. So I prefer to move from the definition of Judith, provided by Judith Maxwell, According to, to her, social cohesion involves building shares, shared values and communities of interpretation, uh, reducing disparities uh, in wealth and income, and generally enabling people to have a sense that they are engaged in a common enterprise, facing shared challenges, and that they are members of the same community. So uh, actually there is, a wild literature, empirical literature, that is giving us some interesting results on how culture can be a key enabler in uh, create uh, a sense of belonging uh, in uh, strengthening local identities. Um, what I've learned from, from such uh, empirical literature that the cultural participation and the accumulation of cultural capital uh, on agents' behavior can be a powerful tool in promoting uh, um, a precondition for a more cohesive and inclusive uh, societies. So, um, what, uh, what we learn 
by doing such, such uh, activities is that when we consider not only cultural participation, but when we consider in our model also uh, social capital, uh, there is, a, I mean, a proxy of uh, social interaction, the magnitude of such effect is, uh, is higher. That's um, what we understood is that uh, cultural participation with uh, social capital and also social cohesion can be more, uh, a power, more and more powerful tool in uh, creating a uh, proactive behavior, in creating a sense of own belonging, and so and so on. Um, so today I'm, I'm talking about, about Fontecchio that is trying to uh, put themselves in uh, itself in, uh, in, in, such, uh, in such framework. Uh, Fontecchio, uh, Fontecchio is uh, within the Sirente Velino Regional Park. Uh, it's a, um, a village, a small village uh, at about 700 meters above uh, sea level. Um, it is a classical uh, uh, inner areas of peripheral areas villages that show uh, traces of Roman, medieval, and Renaissance monuments um, that show so a rural settlement with a rich cultural heritage. And to, today, Fontecchio is uh, is, is involved in uh, in boosting a cultural led development. Uh, by looking at the regeneration, the regenerating power of arts and the sense of, of that. As all uh, the inner areas, uh, Fontecchio is hit by the population, the great, uh, and has gone through a steady period of abandonment uh, with high social costs in terms of socioeconomic as well as hydrogeological instability. But in Italy, uh, inner areas cover around 60% of national land surface and counting for almost 24% of the total population. How? Why Fontecchio is interesting? Because Fontecchio uh, anchored his, uh, his uh, strategic vision and strategic plan to the Faro Convention. Fontecchio was the first Italian municipality to uh, implement the, uh, the principle and the rationale behind the Faro Convention. Faro Convention um, that was already mentioned by the case of Bergamo uh, is a multilateral council of Europe treaty uh, where states agreed to protect cultural heritage and to um, encourage uh, citizens to access and to participate in, in cultural heritage. Uh, as we know, the convention was uh, signed in uh, 2005 in Portugal, but it comes uh, in force uh, in 2011, ratified by 10 states, and now 20 states ratified it. And of course, the uh, final convention try to uh, achieve the goal to develop and manage community heritage asset with active civil society involvement. The rationale behind uh, the Fontecchio strategic plan, as well the uh, Faro Convention, is to recreate uh, an ecosystem in which people, plays, and narratives come together to, 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 to put uh, a place in the uh, over the um, the trajectory of culture-led development. So the pillars uh, are, of course, develop a democratic participation and social responsibility, improving the environment and the quality of life, managing cultural diversity and mutual understanding, supporting, of course, a vivid social cohesion. How Fontecchio implemented the such uh, uh, pillars? Uh, first of all, try to integrate you know, the rational, uh, the narrative, the people in the place in a process of restoration and a revitalization in order to achieve a change in the urban tissue, in the urban social tissue uh, 
by moving from uh, encouraging uh, participation and social responsibility. And by moving from a uh, uh, intense and deep process of uh, acknowledging about the role of heritage and the particular heritage in uh, achieving uh, uh, sustainable cultural development goals. Um, and of course, from the economic or the direct economic impact, try to boost a sort of sustainable tourism in, um, in the municipalities in the place around Fontecchia. Uh, today we present only two projects, uh, a project that was considered uh, in the federal convention as a best practice that is called Casa in Bottego, in Bottega, sorry. Um, and the second one is a project that has to be uh, the Casa in Bottego has been implemented, just implemented, and then the second one will be implemented in the, uh, at the beginning of this September. Uh, Casa in Bottega uh, project uh, moves, well, try to uh, cope with the four main uh, issues that are social housing, um, environmental uh, management and protection, um, social community of cooperatives, and sustainable mobility. Um, this, this project uh, moves from the, of course, the earthquake in 2009 that hits the uh, Abruzzo region, particularly uh, the Lapila municipality and all the villages and the little center uh, near and around the cratere uh, of the earthquake, among them from Montecchio. And, and so the idea, the goal of the initiative was to put together local authority, um, Pontecchio community, uh, civil society facilitator, facilitator, sorry, association in order to uh, revitalize what? To revitalize the um, abandoned and destroyed uh, part of the the center, uh, that thanks to the funds for the reconstruction uh, was uh, rebuilt, and to put in, in, in such spaces uh, people working together, not only working together uh, with workshop, but also to sharing a social experience and giving the possibility to rent with very low uh, prices uh, these spaces in order to recreate, to renovate such uh, uh, urban tissue uh, abandoned uh, before and after the, uh, the earthquake. The second project is uh, a summer school, child summer school, the acronym was uh, stay for uh, uh, cultural heritage identity and local development. Um, that is organized in two basic moments. Uh, the first part tried to collect uh, ideas, theoretical framework, good practice, uh, try to attract knowledge outside the uh, municipality boundaries to uh, exchange, uh, exchange knowledge, uh, knowledge in a process of uh, oriented to uh, to boost the territorial capabilities. And a second phase that is uh, the aim to uh, put together creative workers uh, coming not only from Frontecchio, but from all the part of Abruzzo and uh, Italy and so on, uh, to, um, and to put them in an active dialogue to uh, try to implement project by moving from the first day of uh, uh, mutual knowledge exchange. But now, my, my point is that, uh, is that um, to be active, vibrant, and planning oriented is not the uh, necessary condition. Uh, sorry, it's a, a necessary condition, but not, it's not a sufficient condition to achieve the goal of culture-led development for a, a cohesion society. What is now missing and what we are working for uh, is a, a sort of interinstitutional collaboration. Collaboration on different level and the hierarchical scale of spatial unit of governance. 
because we have to consider that Fontecchio is nested in L'Aquila as a um, spatial unit of governance, L'Aquila in uh, Abruzzo region, Italy, and so on uh, to Europe. So now we have uh, um, an unprecedented opportunity to use uh, the huge amount of flows that will arrive from, from Europe, uh, flows from the recovery and the um, resilience plan, uh, and to be, uh, and um, we have to know that Abruzzo is a paradigmatic region uh, to uh, the worst, uh, I'm gonna say, um, applying and uh, um, using such uh, such opportunities. But um, if we set up a sort of interinstitutional uh, governance and uh, way of, of, of plan. I think that all, also a, a small village can, uh, can, can really put itself in a, in a, in a trajectory of, of, of a cultural development. In that case, I'm working uh, with the municipality of L'Aquila and with the, the Abruzzo region as well to, uh, to let this um, interinstitutional mechanism could work. Uh, as for the Carta of L'Aquila, is a, an important manifesto, is a document uh, that has its main goal is to overcome the classical municipality boundaries to, of course, to achieve a sort of territorial development by moving from a pivot municipality, but at the same time linking in a, uh, in a more functional way, all the uh, other villages that are linked, that are near to uh, this pivot municipality. In the same time, uh, we are working on the strategic uh, regional framework uh, to, um, to build a coherent financial matrix in order to let uh, all the um, municipality less alone because one of I'm also coordinating uh, an horizon 2020 on uh, CCIs and inclusive sustainable development in Europe. No? And during our um, workshop or our webinar, what we learned uh, is that um, a lot of creative workers as well creative or cultural institutions feel alone. They can, uh, and it is a measure. It, it, it is a measure of uh, not inclusive or not inclusivity. <laughs> uh, they feel alone. They can find themselves inside a scheme, a strategic vision, but also a pragmatic uh, approach in order to gain or to, 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 to build a cultural -led development uh, model and uh, asset. Uh, and so uh, our uh, next goal is to build such financial metrics in order to, um, to catch all the projects that arose, that arise from the, the territory and to let them uh, um, um, collocate, put in, the, in, in some part of the, of the metrics when a project is, or a, even a little municipal, municipality, can find what kind of instruments, what kind of measures or access or EU funds can be useful in to support their strategy and their uh, planning activities and and so on. I think that without this is a, a point that should be stressed uh, more and more in the in the next month because. Uh, I said before, we are witnessing an, uh, an unprecedented moment uh, which we can really uh, use uh, efficiently such opportunity from EU. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And I think that the, the Fontecchio case study shows very convincingly that there is no really size limit in terms of how ambitious and forward-looking you can be. The fact that a small village like Fontecchio has been the first to, to fully endorse and, and to implement the FARO Convention shows also that you can have a vision from this point of view. 
And I think that uh, especially in the context of the, reconst the reconstruction, the recovery strategies that will be increasingly addressing, of course, uh, small uh, towns uh, and rural areas across Europe, uh, not only, I think that this is really a fantastic example and inspiration for many other different uh, towns and villages that are uh, in similar contexts. So thanks so much, Alessandro. And now I will turn to Florinda Sayeva. Uh, Florinda is one of the two engines of this uh, fantastic case study. I, I cannot use any, any other adjective to define it. That is Farm Cultural Park. It's a sort of miracle. But I don't want to use uh, properly the, the, the word miracle because it seems that it's something uh, extraordinary, extra supernatural. Whereas what the, what the Florinda uh, and uh, Andrea Bartoli uh, uh, her husband did in Favara is not a miracle, is not extraordinary, is not supernatural. It simply shows how transformational culture can be even in the most difficult environmental circumstances. What we have is probably the most, uh, the most striking example of social innovation, true cultural participation that we, we can observe in your Florinda, the screen is yours. I cannot share the screen. Why? Okay. Maybe okay. there was a similar okay. problem. Okay. With yeah, 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 yeah. It works no, now. No, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Very good. It works now. But we start on the last. <laughs> Okay, just a minute. Okay. Okay, hello, and thank you for this invitation. It's a, a great honor to be here today. And uh, I will try to tell uh, uh, about uh, the work we have done in Favara in uh, the last 10 years. Uh, talking uh, about uh, Farm Cultural Park. This is how Favara was uh, 10 uh, years uh, ago. And uh, now I, I show you uh, what is Farm Cultural Park. Farm is an independent cultural center. Uh, we are in uh, Favara, near the Valley of the Temples of Agrigento, in the heart of Sicily. And definitely better than my word, uh, this 19 second video will take uh, you into the story. I start, okay. I think Favara is one of the world's capital of urban regeneration. Lovely people, lovely place. Nobody believed it was possible to attract hundreds of thousands of tourists to Favara from all over the world. They were wrong. At a certain point, a spaceship landed. Since then, everything started to change. Today, Farm Cultural Park acts like a tornado in the current debate about how small communities can survive global changes and economic crisis. Young people from all over southern Italy are changing their towns. Okay. Children of Favara are having an experience that children of New York, Tokyo, and Milan can only dream of. Florinda and Andrea are dedicating their entire life to this project. It's an enormous commitment. Farm is questioning the ugly habits of the political and bureaucratic system. In Favara, they are playing an important game that concerns the whole country. Who will win? The old corrupt system or the power for a change? A lot of people uh, ask us uh, why we created a farm. Uh, with my husband, Andrea, uh, we live between Sicily and Paris. Uh, when Carla was, uh, Carla is uh, our daughter, when I uh, was about uh, to turn three and uh, like a whole couple had uh, to decide where to build uh, our life project. 
when uh, we decided to leave Paris and uh, return to Sicily, we struggled between uh, two very conflicting feelings, uh, fear and the love. We were afraid to deprive Carla and uh, Viola, our daughters, of the possibilities, the beauty, the energy, and the culture of a city like Paris. And uh, on uh, the other hand, uh, the love of our parents and the love for our land, Sicily, drove us to make a promise uh, to ourselves. We would uh, not cry. We would, we would not expect anyone to change our life for us, but we would do uh, everything in our power to make Favara a nicer city for us, for our little girl, for uh, our friends, for everyone. But what uh, have we done in uh, these 10, 11 years? We have also the thousands of artists and creatives, installation and exhibition. We're able to question our most important uh, values that led us to take a position that inspired how has to become agent of a change. We believe uh, necessary for artists and exhibition to become nomads uh, to across frontiers, both physically and mentally. Overcoming uh, national borders, hello, language and culture to spread in all direction to widen the horizon of translation skills. Uh, he is uh, Seb Twisan, uh, and uh, the, the name of the project is uh, The Share of the World, and it is a very interesting uh, uh, project. But uh, education is the most important thing for us. So is uh, the School of Architecture for Children. In uh, less than five uh, years, uh, our children have the privilege of meeting and taking lessons with uh, hundreds uh, of teachers from all over the, the world, including two curators of the Biennale of Venice. And uh, we were guests of So Fujimoto in Paris and Norman Foster in uh, London. Uh, they designed uh, uh, skyscrapers for cats, uh, monument, uh, school, uh, urban garden, place for children, teenager, uh, some time for Martian. And we started in Favara five years ago. And today uh, there are eight architecture school for children around uh, Italy. But last year, uh, we also had Jill Morris, uh, the first woman ambassador from the UK to Italy. Uh, she was a guest of Prime Minister. Prime Minister is a, a school of politics for young women, aged 13 to 19 years old, by Farm and uh, Movimenda. And the goal is uh, to inspire a new generation of young women introducing them to politics uh, are the heart of uh, interpreting and uh, guiding society, uh, discussing democracy, activism, social justice, and leadership. And uh, now you are probably uh, wondering what effect uh, our work had on Favara. Art and the beauty, creativity, and education has offered uh, everyone the opportunity to see themselves differently, to feel like a superhero. And it has uh, allowed people and the place to connect. In these fascinating years, uh, we have seen and continue to see uh, a change in the city. Many young people move by enthusiasm, engage in new business, as so many parts of the city previously in the ruins but today returning to the community. COVID-19 made us understand even more how, is, how important it is to do things together. And on May 14, we have a bird of a new utopia, 
the società per azioni buone. I show you, show you another video. There is a lie that nothing can change, that we are in a world in decline within which what we think and do can't make the difference, that we have no choice. We subject ourselves to a limit that no one has imposed on us, and that we have given ourselves with our way of thinking and doing, or rather not thinking and not doing. The limit is all in our head, and the copy of the copy of the copy of an attitude. Every 10 years we have a new utopia. And uh, with the word good, we are bending the traditional instrument uh, company of capitalism in Italia in a social enterprise. With these tools, every citizen of Favara in 10 years will be the owner of a portion of a parking, lot of social housing, of a cultural center, of a nurses, and we will match does win how on strategic development properties with how there we can invest money and still how there we have the skills necessary to care out this process. Our city have all the resources they need to be able to emancipate themselves and the whole and uh, that all we need is a change of mentality. We want to invest in a public space, in education of future generation, in an efficient and sustainable housing complex. We want to invest in a training and the insertion of young people at work, not all avoiding that they move to other city to find a job but instead attracting others to come and live in Favara. But let's think about it for a moment. Why should think people of common sense continue to invest in companies they know nothing about? Either in coal, oil, and building, and not in the development project of their city. Now, before saying goodbye and thank you for your attention, I am happy to present uh, and invite you this year to Favara for Countless Cities, the second edition, the Biennial of the City of the World. So thanks so much, uh, Florinda, for this. Uh, are, are, is, is it over, Florinda, or is it still uh, ongoing, the presentation? Okay. So thanks is so much. A biennial? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Go ahead, Florida. I invite you this summer to this summer travel around the world in uh, Favara. We host uh, twenty more uh, uh, city cities. Thanks to extraordinary work of uh, our curator, we have given voice to the protest of uh, Hong Kong uh, students, 
uh, we host uh, uh, L'Aquila, uh, Soveria Mannelle, and a different uh, city over the, the world. Uh, the, the focus is that people live here, good business, uh, parkification, and uh, a different place uh, to, to live. Uh, thank you, and we wait uh, to Favala. Thanks so much, Florinda, for this uh, marvelous presentation, uh, which really energized us because, uh, you know, it, it's not simply the making things possible, but think, thinking big, but big in a very mm -hmm. realistic and at the same time ambitious way, also in situations in which you would think that uh, just uh, surviving uh, or just uh, going on with some, uh, let's say, decent activity would be enough. But uh, especially, what, what I mean, there are so many elements to like about Farm Cultural Park, but this idea, for example, of giving a, a direct contribution to culture, for example, to a new generation of female leadership is something that I really find uh, fantastic and transformational because of course there is lots of lip service towards this, but uh, not so many who really engage in this, uh, in this uh, endeavor, but uh, also, uh, this fact that you can also change the notion of uh, what is economic rationality in terms, as you said, of investing in your own hometown. In the end, that's the place where you live. That's the place where uh, the, your choices matter the most, not in some uh, distant place uh, just to, to have uh, some more returns from, uh, let's say, uh, financial speculation that does not really really leave you any, any value added in terms of your everyday life. I think that these concepts are really inspiring and transformational. And again, I, I, I am, well, I, it's not just my conviction, it's clear that fa uh, Farm and Favara are now becoming a benchmark for so many other realities across the world. And uh, we, we really hope that, they will that this will really create that uh, snowball uh, movement that, that we really need uh, to, 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 to bring out about social change uh, through culture. Thanks so much, uh, Florinda. And now speaking you, about social innovation, um, it's natural to give the screen, the floor to Bertram Nissen because Bertram through the activity of Kefare and now with this new project called La Guida about which Bertram we will tell us in a minute uh, has been one of the beacons of exploring uh, the new undercurrent, still very much undercurrent because for example, the, the media are not particularly aware about that but uh, this undercurrent movement of culture-driven social innovation that has been scattering through Italy in the last uh, 15 years, and that with the various editions of the prize of uh, Kefare have been uh, brought to light and uh, uh, have again inspired so many local players, but also have shown that from this point of view, Italy is today a cradle of social innovation through culture that has a very, very few uh, uh, analogies at the moment. And so it's, it's very important to explore this new reality and to understand especially what could be the next steps. So Bertram, the screen is yours. Thank you Pierluigi and thank you very much to all for your invitation. I'm glad to be here and to have the opportunity to share some insights about the activity of Kefar and Laguid especially uh, with an international audience. Um, I'm the president and scientific director of Kefare that can be roughly translated in what is to be done we are an agency for a cultural transformation and we act as a second level organization for the empowerment of cultural um, grassroots projects uh, all over Italy and with some uh, European uh, collaboration. We operate basically on three um, main uh, action fields. The first one is the production and curation of cultural debate related to several different topics, uh, but that, revol that revolves around local activism, uh, cultural economy, digital humanities, art design and literature related to politics, and obviously, uh, as Pierluigi Luigi said, uh, uh, social innovation and cultural innovation. Uh, the second level is the, uh, the second action field uh, is the uh, production on our own or, and or in connection with other organizations of projects, uh, of cultural projects uh, um, that deals with uh, public art, uh, with um, um, archives liberation, um, with the crowd definition, which is very important for us, uh, of new vocabularies for specific communities and audiences. And uh, as a third area, we work uh, as a think tank 
and, and the research center. Um, so we run basically uh, advisory activities for uh, big institutions, for grassroots activists at the same time, for cultural organization, and also for public administrations. Uh, talking about La Guida, La Guida, which is, can be translated as the guide, uh, is our national program um, for the empowerment of new cultural centers in Italy. Uh, new cultural centers, exactly like the uh, farm uh, run by Florinda uh, Sayeva, um, are spread all over Europe, but um, we think we know that uh, in Italy they have a special place. Uh, from the point of view of the of the of their uh, um, position in the production and consumption of uh, culture and specifically of collaborative culture, they can be called in several different ways. They are called in several different ways. For example, they are called uh, spazi culturali indipendenti, so independent cultural spaces, um, spazi culturali polifunzionali, multifunctional cultural spaces or uh, Centri Culturali di Nuova Generazione, which are uh, new generation cultural spaces, hybrid spaces, project spaces, and so on. Each new cultural center is radically different from the others, and this is very important for us, uh, from many points of view, from the point of view of social and political views, from the point of view of the cultural activities, the activities that they run, uh, also from the point of view of their uh, aesthetical conception mm, and their aesthetical statements. But at the same time, uh, they, have, they share some uh, key characteristics. On one side, they have this uh, small and medium dimensions. They are characterized by a strong diversification and heterogeneity of uh, spaces. So they are a mixture of libraries, cafes, restaurants, workshops, theaters, uh, exhibition spaces, fab labs, maker space, co-workings, and so on. Uh, there are places for many different kinds of uh, cultural practices. So artist residences, concerts, DJ sets, um, community gardens, uh, digital manufacturing, uh, etc. What I think it's particularly interesting and in now in these years of the COVID-19 is that they mix uh, uh, very different audiences. So uh, they mix uh, audiences composed by young people, elders, uh, professionals, migrants, and so on. Uh, it's extremely interesting the fact that they um, are places or platforms for the development uh, and empowerment of local communities, uh, of practices, are seen activist networks, etc. So they are basically at the crest, continuously at the crossroads among very different networks um, and systems of linkings. Um, there are places for the vertic vertical culture, uh, cultural experimentation, because um, in Italy mainly, these are the main places for the experimentation of new languages new technologies related to culture and, and, and the arts um, for uh, the experimentation of new forms of uh, participatory and collaborative culture. Um, more important here probably is the fact that uh, there are uh, places for the development of uh, social and cultural capital at the local level. So there are places uh, that are uh, deeply interconnected with the improvement of social cohesion on one side, but also with the new challenges and conflicts that arise from the territories. Uh, there are obviously uh, places for, uh, we can call them uh, hubs for uh, creative and cultural industries. And a, a, a thing that we have found in the last three years that is extremely interesting is that there are places that uh, challenge the public administration uh, for institutional learning continuously and deeply. And this is extremely important. Uh, they can be actors also for the uh, valorization of material and immaterial cultural heritage, both from the historical point of view and on the contemporary one. So they are spread all over Italy. Um, in the north, in the south, in the centers, in the peripheries, in the countryside, in the mountains, for example, it's plenty of uh, um, art centers, uh, independently, independent art centers uh, in the mountains or in the, on, the, on, the, on the seaside. Um, they are attended by thousands, um, hundreds of people, and they are uh, represented also uh, by several, several local and uh, national networks. But at the same time, they don't have uh, a precise and defined uh, place in the representation of the Italian cultural sector. This is our main point. Uh, because they have, 
uh, a clear and established uh, local identity. And for example, Favara, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect example. They are one of the very few uh, new cultural centers that um, started from a very small place and gained a national international uh, audience. Uh, but normally, uh, new cultural centers have uh, a lack of national recognition as key places for cultures. Uh, this is the reason why we have decided to produce uh, uh, La Guida. La Guida is composed of several phases on the whole country. It's a national program. So in 2019, we have run Bagliore, which uh, was a residency program in six cultural centers all over Italy, in uh, small villages and big cities, Borca di Cadore, Catania, uh, Civitella Casanova in Abruzzo, Palermo, San Vito de Normanni, and Turin. Um, uh, where six young writers have written six reportage on the new cultural centers uh, and uh, a book had, has been uh, published at the end by Il Saggiatore, which is one of the main publishing houses in Italy. Uh, in, 2000, in, in 2019, we have also organized Molto Presto, very soon, uh, today's gathering in La Triennale di Milano, uh, where we have investigated the main challenges for the activity of new cultural centers from the economic, organizational, and cultural points of view, together with uh, several different stakeholders. On one side, our organization, new cultural centers, obviously, but also social enterprises, researchers, researchers and policymakers. In 2020, we launched the La Call, a nationwide uh, research program for the mapping of new cultural centers all around the country. At the moment, we have identified uh, 700 uh, different new cultural centers, but we are still counting. Uh, and now we are uh, starting to work with some university for a systematization of the data sets and for the sharing uh, uh, also outside of Italy. In March, uh, 2020, we launched La Guida, a festival, the, the proper La Guida, uh, which uh, was born as a festival for new cultural centers in, in the northwest of Italy, so in Piedimont, Liguria, and Valle d'Aosta, uh, funded by the Bank Foundation Compagnia di San Paolo. Um, and for La Guida, the first edition was focused on cultural particip participation, which today is one of the main, um, the main uh, topics. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, attended by nearly 70 uh, cultural centers and dozens of researcher, researchers and policymakers uh, uh, nationwide in workshop, uh, conferences, and seminars. Um, the result. Uh, Obviously, at the very beginning, our idea was to make a three days festival, but given the, the, the pandemic condition, we uh, spread the festival in six months um, of, uh, um, uh, as I told, uh, seminars, uh, conferences, camps, uh, workshops, and so on. And the result is a set of 11 policy proposals uh, that we are now evolving and implementing together with universities research centers um, and second level organizations. Uh, this year, we are working uh, on uh, La Guida as a research. What does it mean? We are uh, working uh, on the challenges uh, of the collaborations uh, between uh, traditional institutions, cu traditional cultural institutions and alternative uh, um, spaces, project spaces, new cultural centers in the fields of contemporary art, uh, or, or more uh, precisely in the field of uh, contemporary culture. So we are taking into account uh, uh, contemporary art, performing arts, experimental music and cinema, literature, philosophy, and so on. Uh, the research uh, focuses uh, on Milan and more, more widely on Lombardy, uh, exactly because it is, as said uh, a couple of hours ago, is one of the regions that have been hit more dramatically uh, by the pandemic crisis uh, of COVID-19. Uh, the research is funded by uh, the Bank Foundation Fondazione Cariplo, uh, and we are now working, uh, after several interviews uh, and some focus groups, we are uh, working to identify some patterns and policy uh, guidelines uh, for establishing procedures and policies of collaboration in the general framework uh, of the uh, proximity city, or um, the 15 minutes uh, city, which is now probably one of the main results uh, at the urban level here in Milan, uh, and not only in Milan, obviously, um, for, for, for tackling the, the, the challenges of uh, COVID-19. 
what we have learned now, so I, I'm going to be very, very, very short because um, uh, time is running. So we have learned basically four lessons that we are trying now to implement and to evolve uh, together with the network of uh, stakeholders and partners uh, that we are uh, gathering around La Guida. For the first lesson is that uh, it's urgent to define uh, new policies of integration, uh, collaboration, and cross-pollination among traditional cultural institutions on one side and cultural centers. Why? Because uh, new cultural centers are strategic actors for um, the production and consumption of culture uh, in pandemic and post-pandemic pandemic uh, territories. So uh, we can't, we, we, we are convinced that it's it's impossible to think uh, culture in the 20s in Europe without taking into account the strategic role of new cultural centers. The second point is, is that it's important to build um, macro uh, definitions, both at the theoretical and the operational level, uh, as it's fundamental to share them with the academic community. Why? Because today, uh, there is a, a, a clear lack of standard definitions um, in, in also in policy making, but first of all in, in the research that weakens the action of policymakers uh, uh, both at the national and international level. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to define uh, common measures because these kind of places are uh, called and defined in very different ways uh, in different uh, European countries. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not only a matter of translation, but it's a matter of um, co-produce uh, internationally a new uh, theoretical framework. Um, the third point is that it's fundamental to collect uh, and share experiences at, at, at least at three levels. The first level is uh, uh, the level of curatorial experiences, because these kind of places are capable to uh, react at the curatorial level in a very um, situated way. The second level is the institutional learning from the policymakers, which is a key factor with no doubts. And the third level is that um, it's uh, very important to share experiences in the experimentation from the point of view of uh, economic sustainability of these places, which are always the, a very strange result of funding mix, uh, personal enterprises, third, action, uh, uh, third sector uh, operations, and local policies. The third point is that uh, it's crucial to work with the gatekeepers uh, at the, uh, of the traditional cultural sector in order to translate in other forms of languages, um, the kind of values that are produced by new cultural centers, because today uh, still they are considered something for the youngsters, they are considered something minor, they are considered something that makes sense only from a very underground and super situated point of view, while today from our point of view and also from the point of view of the uh, 100,000 of people that uh, attend these kind of places is exactly the contrary. They are one, one of the main backbones for um, civic and cultural uh, participation uh, uh, in the country. So, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bertram. I think uh, you, you, you gave us a very clear and impressive picture of how systematic countrywide this movement is. So it's extremely important at this point to connect it also with this new cycle of post-pandemic recovery, because of course the seats are already there, especially if we think of the emphasis that has been given to smaller rural communities and not only to metropolitan areas. We already have in some sense the backbone of uh, already uh, practicing players. So this is not really wishful thinking. This, this is registering an ongoing process. And so the real point is now to, to streamline this into the new strategies. And I'm very happy that you stress the importance of uh, escalating this perception to the level of, uh, of uh, public administrators and public policymakers that seem to be mostly unaware of what's going on from this point of view. And especially what is the, the attitude behind this? That's not simply a matter of what's happening, but why and through what means. So thank you very much for this presentation. So we, we are largely beyond schedule, but I am not uh, unhappy about that because we had so many contents. And uh, there is a, just a, a quick space for one uh, of the many questions that arrive from the floor. 
a question from Leonardo Zanobetti, and I invite any of our panelists that want to respond. I think we can make uh, space for a, a most uh, couple of answers from our panelists. But I think that the question is really worthwhile to pick up. Uh, the question is: Thank you for uh, thank you very much for the insightful presentations, which have shown brilliant examples of how our heritage can help to revitalize local communities. To what extent do you think investment in heritage can improve cohesion and bridge the gap between those regions that have become clusters of industrial activity and innovation on one side and those regions that are lagging behind on the other? So is there anybody who wants to respond? Well, so probably our, our panelists are, are a bit worn out uh, after such an intense presentation. I will just give uh, a brief response myself from this point of view. I think that uh, uh, clearly there is, um, we, we have seen examples in which this uh, social cohesion is not just an objective, but is a means through which this can be, this can be done. Because clearly the new models of local growth, uh, culture driven growth, are models in which uh, you cannot really succeed without um, building a, a, a real, uh, uh, not simply participation, but, but a real collaboration from all the local forces. So the point is also experimenting with new models of uh, local growth in which uh, the point is not just to think of different silos that are, let's say the social component, the economic component or the tourism component or what it is, or the public administration one is very much about uh, today uh, crisscrossing these different sectors. And what these uh, social innovation practices are showing us is exactly this, which is in the end also the, the, the basic thought behind uh, the notion of a cultural crossovers that has been launched by the new European Agenda for Culture in 2018. So, of course, there would be much more to say, but I think that uh, some of our, uh, uh, the last examples uh, showed very, very well how this can be done in practice. So thank you so much. And I just uh, give back now the, the screen uh, to Katia for the closing remarks for this first uh, uh, open international part of our webinar. Katia, screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Pierluigi. I think um, Doris wanted also to. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, add to your answer, yeah. maybe to the questions. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I did want to follow up on what Pierluigi said because one of the lessons that we learn from art is that art is a process; it's not a product. So when Pierluigi says that what we're learning is how to negotiate, how to um, enter uh, traditional spaces, turn them into new spaces, uh, this, is, this is a process that is not only about art, but it's making art because we, uh, we can remember that it's about process. The product is just evidence that we've made art. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Doris. This is a very beautiful final uh, thought remark we should really take uh, away from uh, this discussion. And I would like to, um, well, in, in closing, to thank once again our partners, the Ministry of Culture of Italy, of course, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and the Italian delegation to the OECD to putting all this in motion and uh, uh, for supporting this uh, project. I would like to really thank all our speakers from our project cities, of course, and also our international speakers who joined us today. And a big thank you to the participants, to the attendees who were uh, with us for this quite long uh, and a very rich uh, discussion. So thank you all. And I invite our project uh, cities to our session, which will start at four o'clock. Uh, and we hope to see you there and to the rest of us uh, will see you at the next uh, uh, OECD webinar, which will happen soon and you'll uh, receive an invitation. Uh, so thank you again and uh, good luck. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>